Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. The world fell forward and with a gasp, I tumbled into cold and hate. My body curled up on the ground and I shuddered convulsively, my mind buzzing and sparking and flashing. My eyes couldn't, didn't, work, and I breathed in shallow, fast gasps. Slowly the sensations of dislocation faded, and I became aware that I was laying on a grill, with enough space between the lines of metal to fit a finger. My eye opened, and I saw that the corridor I was in was lit by a pale, unearthly blue luminescence. A soft voice spoke in a language I knew. Station time is error. I closed my eyes. My hand pushed to the floor and I shoved myself to my feet. My body unfolded with a series of creaks and pops, and I gasped as I finally stood straight. My head spun, and I grabbed onto the wall to keep myself from toppling right back to my knees. My skin prickled, and I realized I was naked, and I knew that there was something deeply shameful in that fact. My eyes closed, and I felt images, disassociated and pulsing with red light, pushing against the back of my mind. They refused to form into coherence. I saw a triangle of metal, grasped in a bleeding hand. I saw an orb of metal, looking down at me. I heard the words, it shall do. I shook my head, I, I had no name, I had no memory. So I decided to get at least some knowledge of myself. When I opened my eyes, I saw that the corridor was not quite a corridor. Rather, it was a pair of rows of machines. Each one was large and squat, and looked like it was designed to contain something with silvery doors and hatches, bolts and latches. A fine mist coiled around my feet, and the chill in the air felt like it had been made for a reason. The machine I had stumbled from remained open. The hatch swung wide. Inside there was a drain, and I could see the last droplets of a pale blue fluid sweeping away. I shuddered and didn't know why. Each machine was labeled. My brow furrowed as I saw mine was labeled with a number. 0451. I shook my head. The interior of the machine had a reflective metallic sheen. I stepped closer, and in the distorted reflection, I saw myself. Strawberry blonde hair, spilling around a wide, heart-shaped face, a small button nose and a pair of cat green eyes, freckles and a trim athletic body. My breasts were large and tipped with a pair of rosy red nipples. Looking down, I saw that they jutted from my chest. They looked firm and perky, and I wondered what it would be like to squeeze them. I shook my head slightly. Focus. A pair of pert pussy lips sat between my thighs, utterly hairless. I had no hair on my body, in fact, beyond my eyebrows and my head. That felt faintly unnatural, but pleasant. I stepped over to the next chamber, 0452, and looked inside the porthole sat on the top of the closed hatch. A death's head leered back at me, desiccated flesh and sunken eyes, teeth clenched in a rictus grin. My heart hammered, and I put my fingers on the machine, trying to feel what had gone wrong. I was alive. This person was dead. Why? I stepped to the next tube. 045i3 was also a shriveled corpse. I started to run now, my whole body jiggling as I ran past row after row of corpses. Dead. Dead. All dead. Who had put so many people into... into... these things? Were we supposed to be dead? My heart sprang into my throat and my toe caught on the grill of the floor. I tripped and skidded forward. I rolled onto my side, gasping, my hand going to my knee. Fuck. I croaked, my voice feeling strange in my throat. I closed my eyes. Had I always sounded like that? Once the pain was under control, I forced myself to my feet, and this time, I walked. It took me a slow eternity to reach a doorway. The door itself actually provided one answer, where I was. Scrawled on the middle of the door, right underneath the window that looked out into the adjoining corridor, was a symbol and a pair of words. The symbol was a gear surrounding a small flame in a golden cup. The words were in the same language I spoke and thought in. English? That was the name, wasn't it? The words. Virgil Station. The door had a black plate of plastic next to it. A glowing interface of numeral keys sprang up when I brought my hand near it. I somehow knew that was going to happen. The numerals went. 
Seven, eight, nine, four, five, six, eight, one, two, three. A zero was tucked into the corner with a backspace and enter key to the other side. I shook my head. What a weird way of arranging numbers. But it was clear the door wanted numbers. I hesitated. Then slowly, I tapped in my machine's numbers. The keypad flashed red and didn't open. I scowled. My fingernail dug into the edge of the plastic, and I yanked it hard. My fingernails ached, but the plastic gave first, revealing the internal guts of the machine. I let my hands work, not questioning it. But I managed to connect that optical core to that wire, and the door hissed. Pneumatic pressure faded, and the door dropped into the floor. I looked at my hands, flexed my fingers, how, how had I done that? Then my vision focused and I saw that there was something more than a mystery hacking ability to worry about. Laying on the floor, tucked up against the corner of the adjoining corridor, was another woman. She was dead, and I could see why. Her mouth was filled with a frothing white liquid, her throat bulging grotesquely. The rest of her body was achingly beautiful, even in death. She had been wearing some kind of nice suit that had been shredded. Her body marked with dozens of cuts that no longer bled. Claws had torn her suit apart, careful to leave the skin underneath untouched. Her legs were cocked wide, and her sex lips dripped with the same thick white fluid that filled her throat. But the thing that made my breath catch was her eyes. <laughs> Even dead, those were the eyes of someone in the throes of intense pleasure. My mouth went dry. My eyes dipped from the obscene scene and I saw laying on the ground about five feet from where she had finally died was a wrench. It was a sturdy Krugmaster 98, made for loosening the kinds of bolts normally only seen on a fusion reactor. I knelt down and grabbed it up, without a second thought. It was a comforting, heavy presence at the end of my arm. I tossed it into the air and caught it again with a meaty thunk. Thanks, I said, her voice still raspy. The dead woman didn't respond. The next hour was a long, furtive quiet time. I moved from room to room in the corridors of this section of the station and found the same story, writ large again and again. Where there were people, those people were dead, and those places were rare. I only counted five other corpses, all men who had been ripped to pieces. This whole part of the station seemed devoted to the clunking, groaning, grinding pieces of machinery that kept everything running. Some rooms were filled with quiet machines, whose purposes were entirely beyond me. Others, though, were more obvious. Storerooms filled with materials and components for fixing the other, quiet machines. But I was able to at least get a rough idea of how the station was formed down here. There was an outer ring of support rooms, all with pipes leading into the ceilings towards the central chambers. On the inner side of the ring there were four chambers, each one identical to the one I had been born in. Long corridors of those coffins, numbered. I was able to find the highest number on the third room from mine and knew that there were 6,666 coffins. I wasn't brave enough to check each coffin to see if any of them held living people like me. I had planned to, but I ended up standing at the end of the chamber, looking at the vast vaulted room, at the tubes leading down into the coffins, at the empty faceplates. I imagined walking past them, and a cold, creeping dread started to fill me. My knees locked and I realized I couldn't move. The thought of looking away was impossible. Instead, my mind could see the image of a coffin opening up and something like me coming out. But rather than warm, living flesh, that thing would be cold and clammy and moist and rotting. Their flesh would creak and groan as they stood, eyes glowing with a pale light. And so I stood there for who knows how long listening only to the faint groaning of the station and the thundering of my heart. If I turned away, the door would open behind me. You're being ridiculous, I thought, but in the end it took an explosion to shake me out of my paralysis. The entire station shuddered and I felt the floor shifting underneath my feet. I staggered, grabbing onto the frame of the door, then looked up and down the curving corridor that made up the outer ring. The dim lights that came from the ceiling flickered on and off, and then a voice came from the ceiling. Bloody hell, is this working? I blinked. Hey, hello? I asked, my voice feeling faintly raspy. Ah, I heard that, the voice said. It was male, deep and slightly lilting. I cocked my head slightly and wondered if he could see me too. I blushed and didn't know why I was embarrassed, 
but I was. I crossed one arm over my breast. Hell, you're in cryosup. Okay, I'm um, shit. Listen, whoever you are, my name is Lucas. I'm in tech support. And I think I might be one of the only people left alive on this bloody station. If you want to survive, we're going to need to work together, okay? I gulped. My hand rubbed my throat as I looked around for some speakers. They had to be amazingly well hidden. Okay, I said, um, what's your name, and he asked. Are you, uh, one of the cryonics? Those coffin things? I asked, biting my lip. Yeah, he said. To then yeah, I said, nodding slowly as I dropped my hand from my throat. What was that sound? Well, ah, uh, that was the sound of the habitation deck station keeping engines exploding. What? I blinked, my mouth opening, then closing. That's bad. That sounds bad. What the fuck is a station keeping engine? I rubbed my face with my palm. Sorry, I... I don't even remember my name. I just woke up in a cough like... Er... Cryonics. Um... It was Labaled. Womb 4 5th one. Okay, I'll start trying to crack the networks for the cryonics. We had a lot of bigwigs in there. We'll see who you are. He chuckled. You're probably five or six steps above me on the social strata. So I'm going to enjoy bossing you around until your memory comes back. I made a face somewhere between a scowl and a smile. Enjoy it. So, station keeping? Right. Virgil Station's in the L3 point, basically a place where Earth and the Moon balance each other out gravitationally speaking. It normally doesn't need much station keeping, but the experiments the boffins were running makes everything screwy. So without our station keeping engine, the ship's going to start slewing out of orbit. If we get too far out, then a week or two from now, we're going to smash the whole thing into the Earth. I gulped. And that's bad, right? Well, for them, Lucas said. If we can't get off this station in two weeks, we'll be dead either way. Though, I mean, wait, 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 wait. If you're free to move around, we could just head for the escape pods and... I closed my eyes, pinching the bridge of my nose, holding up my hand. Lucas cut himself off. I should get upstairs to habitation, shouldn't I? I sighed quietly. The idea of just getting out of this place was tempting, but no. I couldn't just let this station, which had to be huge if this was just part of it, drop onto the earth. How long do we have to fix the engines? Lucas coughed. Two hours before the degradation becomes irreversible. Fucking wonderful, I muttered. The first thing Lucas helped me get was some clothes. Turned out one of the storage rooms had lockers that I hadn't been able to access by touching their open buttons. Lucas told me the passkey for his locker, and I punched it in. Rather than finding clothes, I found a sleek collar and a small tube of grey-looking liquid. I picked up the tube, my brow furrowing ever so slightly. What is down there? Right, you're missing out on important facts. Lucas's voice cut me off. That's a container of nanites. The collar's a clothing fabricator. In engineering, we had to have clothes tailored to specific situations. Best choice was a sheet of nanites. Huh, I said. I undid the collar, frowning as I looked at the interior. It seemed to be smooth silver, though it was etched with an odd set of curving symbols. The name that sprang unbidden to mind was runes. But I had no idea what a rune was, or why the symbols made me think of them. I traced one with a finger and felt a strange, uncomfortable nervousness slide through my spine. Lucas, are you sure these are safe? Sure are, he said. I mean, safe as anything else on this bloody station. I gulped. I could just... What? Wander around bare arsed? He asked, sounding amused. Embarrassment filled me. I felt my whole body turn bright red. You, you can't see me, can you? I asked. We're well. He was watching me. His eyes were on my bare ass, on my pale skin. He could see the swell of my breasts, the hard nubs of my nipples. Everything. I closed my eyes and clenched my jaw, the embarrassment becoming shame and arousal. Intense, confusing arousal, arousal that made my pussy glisten. I snapped the collar onto my neck without a second thought. Nothing happened. You need to put the nanites into the socket near the front, Lassie, Lucas said. I found the socket with my thumb, 
Attaching the tube of nanites to it was a matter of moments. The collar buzzed, and a thin line of gray goop started to spread from the bottom half. It flowed along my skin like cold water mixed with mud. My nipples grew stiffer stiff as the goop dripped down my breasts. But rather than falling to the ground, the droplets swung around and cleaved to my breasts like a second layer of skin. The cool tight grip of the material around my nipples felt as snug and as comfortable as a lover's grasp. Then it tightened slightly and I whimpered as my breasts became perkier and thrust out, supported by a lattice of nanites. The flowing liquid came to my bare pussy slithering over my sex with the same disquieting sensation. I squirmed and bit my lip hard to keep from moaning as the coolness slurped up between my thighs, looping around to find the cleft of my ass. It spread outwards and upwards, meeting with the nanites that came from the back of my shoulders. I looked down and found a whimper, escaping my clenched teeth as the thin line of nanites that pressed to my sex drew taut. I was essentially wearing a completely skin-tight layer of paint that formed the rough shape of a one-piece bathing suit, as designed by a fetishistic Japanese anime studio. The fuck was an anime? Why don't I have pants, Lucas? I snarled, arousal and embarrassment transmuting, through the magic of a human soul, into anger. You're a tall lassie, Lucas said, his voice so studiously neutral that I was sure he was popping a heart on as tough as my wrench. Well, you'll have to live with it, until we can find more nanites. We're not getting those other lockers open unless... I grabbed my wrench and brought it smashing down into one of the lockers. The door bent inwards, and the electronic lock crunched with an ear-popping squeal. Red lights flashed on the lock, and I smashed again, causing the door to cave inwards. It was made of really cheap metal, lightweight rather than sturdy. I used the wrench in the opening I had made to lever the door open and grabbed another tube of nanites. Soon they were flowing along my thighs and knees. Blood hell, Lucas said, ask me before you do something like that. It worked, didn't it? I asked, eyeing the other lockers. Aye, it worked, it set off every security alarm on Cyronics. He groaned. Shite, shite, shite. I thought the only thing I had to worry about was those. I paused. What the fuck is going on on the station? That's just it, he said through clenched teeth. We got monsters running around, the security system's gone a who, and you just called down two fucking TCS drones to check out what the noise is. And lassie, they don't ask nice in cryonics. I blinked. Oh. Lucas sighed. You better run, lassie, and don't stop. Say I started for the door, but the sound of the drones approaching stopped me dead. There was something horrible in the sound they made. It was a rattling sound, but so fast that it became an almost tearing sound. Worse was their voices, computerized and deep. Stop, lawbreaker, I run ice and I hefted my wrench. From the sound of their approach, I knew I couldn't outrun them. But they sounded big and rattling, so I stepped back and away from the door. Then the first drone came to the door itself, and I was struck almost dumb by their design. At first, I thought that a massive hula hoop had come to kill me but it was too wide, too thick. The outer edge of the ring was studded with metal that looked designed to cling to walls and graded floors with thick, curved teeth that glinted in the pale light of the room. Between the teeth were circular eye cameras, each one glowing with a malignant red flare, as if the whole thing had been set on fire. Looped within the ring was a second ring, providing a pair of wheels that could rotate and spin the drone around in any direction. More, I saw that the ring was compressible, squeezing through the door and shifting the two rings, so they overlapped to make it as thin as possible. I figured that a security drone should try and stop to capture a lawbreaker, but whatever had gone wrong in the station had turned capture to try and run me the fuck over. The drone shot forward, and I only escaped it by the skin of my teeth, diving out of the way. The ring smashed into the wall of lockers behind me, causing several dozen to spring open at once. Their locks started to flash and whir with red lights, and I groaned inwardly at the idea of even more security alarms going off. But I had no more time for thinking. The second drone had arrived, and was also pushing its way into the room. I stepped forward, and brought my wrench smashing down into one of the camera eyes. It shattered, and the drone stopped as if it was assessing damage. The wrench felt light, adrenaline surging through my body as I brought the wrench down again. Another camera.
I stepped back and managed to get in one last smack. The other drone, though, started to rev up and back away from the wall. It aimed at me. I shifted quickly, moving into the drone in the door's blind spot. Both shot forward and I sprang aside, up. both smashed home. Metal claws and spikes smashed and locked together, ring surfaces deformed beyond their limits. And then I sprang in and started bashing both with the wrench, aiming at any weak spot I could. Metal flew and I felt something tug at my sleeve, but then I stepped back and the two drones lay on the ground. Their ring surfaces snapped in half like busted tires. Their cameras had covered the ground with shattered glass, something that made me stand perfectly still until I had surveyed the situation. I looked down and saw that my left arm had a thin slit of red along it, and the red was growing. I hissed, my hand going to my bloody cut. That made it hurt more. I closed my eyes. You're alive? Lucas asked. I laughed quietly, adrenaline buzzing through my body. I was horny. Should people be horny after a fight? I shook my head from side to side and stepped gingerly around the glass to check the other lockers, speaking as I did so. I seem to be. I found that most of the lockers were empty, save for a few more of those nanovials. Then I saw something tucked away in the one at the far end. My brow furrowed. Lucas, who was T. Dubois? I asked. He was the security officer for cryonics, Lucas said. He's different now. I hefted the pistol that had been tucked away in the locker. I checked the magazine with a cool efficiency that I hadn't known I had, and noticed that the nanites I wore had reacted to the blood soaking them. They focused, clumped, then filled into the wound. I felt a tiny pricking sensation run through my skin. Then the nanites faded away and revealed that the wound had become a thin scar. Regenerating clothes. Nice. I also noticed that the rip in my clothes remained. I frowned and then touched one of the nanite tubes to my collar. The clothes healed. So my clothes could heal me, but that used up the nanites. I got to work there, kicking chunks of glass out of the way. I found a backpack in one of the lockers and stuffed it full of the nanite tubes. I tucked my wrench into it and then slung the backpack over my shoulders. I adjusted the straps, reaching backwards. I could grab onto the wrench as it thrust from the back of the backpack. I grinned and let my hand drop. I had a backup weapon. As I held up the pistol, I saw a tiny glowing holographic haze flare to life around the handle in the barrel. A number popped up. It agreed with my count. I had seven bullets out of fourteen. I frowned. What had Dubois been shooting at him? I was afraid I was going to find out. They're called the Tesk, Lucas said as I grabbed onto the next rung of the maintenance shaft that he had determined was the safest, fastest way to get from cryonics to engineering. A timer ticked away in the back of my mind. We has an hour and ten minutes before Virgil Station slewed out of the L3 point and started on a steady course back towards Earth. Apparently, there was jack and shit the Earth governments could do to stop it. Not because they lacked heavy lifters or shuttles, or even really big guns. No, it was worse. Lucas had explained that the whole station was stealthed. Because, of course. The test? I asked, my brow furrowing as I pushed myself up. My left leg was starting to cramp. Climbing a mile of station was nothing to take lightly. I hooked my arms, shifted, and leaned back against the inside of the shaft. That let me relax. The ache in my leg faded slowly and stubbornly, as Lucas sighed loudly. The Tesk, it's short for Tesseract. He sighed again. The boffins who made this place were doing some weird shite with gravity. That's why this bloody place doesn't need to spin, and why it needs station-keeping thrusters despite being gravitationally locked with the bloody moon. He grumbled. It's an arse for a technician like myself, but what can you do? Quit, I suggested, and get sent into Temple Soft's mental rewiring chambers? Fat chance, Lucas said. I frowned. Temple Soft was apparently the corporation that owned this place. I filed that unsettling detail away for later. Lucas continued. The test came through when some boffin switched on some bloody device. They're aliens or something, he said. They take people, kill them, change them, do things to them. My mind flashed back to the dead woman in cryonics. 
the look of ecstasy on her face, frozen there forever by her snapped neck. I shuddered convulsively, then forced myself to start moving again. Another rung. Another rung. I bit back the urge to ask Lucas if he could tell me how much time we had left before the destabilization happened. If I needed to hurry, I was pretty sure he'd tell me. I closed my eyes and went through the plan again. Going straight to habitation was a fool's game. We'd need the parts to fix the engine and the suit to let me go outside in the first place. So we head straight for engineering. I snorted loudly. What's so funny, Lucas asked, and just I thought that we were going, but it's just me, I said, frowning. Oi, I didn't ask to be kept in a bloody broom closet for the whole bloody week, Lucas said, sounding annoyed. If there wasn't a food dispenser in here, I'd already be gnawing off me own arm. Now listen, the Tesk don't always kill. They do if you try and kill them right back, but if you're cornered, then you don't have any choice. Well, my frown grew more focused. Well, what? I asked. You know, he coughed awkwardly, and no, I don't. I have amnesia, I said, but I was coldly certain that I knew exactly what Lucas was suggesting, and part of me tingled all over at the idea. But I was so keyed up, so eager for something to happen after the fight with the drones, that I think I'd have gotten off at the idea of kissing a pig. Another part of me just remembered the poor girl, with her neck snapped and her cunt dripping with tesk seed. Fortunately, life contrived to get me distracted from that mental image by bringing my face nose to nose with the hatch leading into engineering. I closed my eyes and muttered a very soft, thank God. The suit I wore squirmed and maybe it was nervous too, getting the hatch open required punching in Lucas's passkey. I tapped the buttons a few times and the alarm light came on. I scowled. Lucas, your key. The bloody computers are trying to lock me out, he said, try again. I tapped in the combination again, frowning. The door hissed open, revealing a narrow industrial corridor. I dragged myself in, my legs buzzing with the exertion that I had put them through. I rubbed my thighs with my hands, my ears perked up. The engineering section of the station already sounded far more active. I could hear hissing and burbling, crackling and humming. The walls were grated and had machines behind the grates. But the ceiling had four lines of tubes, and each one was painted a bright red, with clear warning signs laid out. Danger, steam. I started forward, pistol held in a lowered grip. I didn't want to just blow away some other survivor by accident. But as I came to the first corner, I heard the sounds of footsteps and a quiet sing-song voice. Sold, 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 sold. It was a female voice, but in... But underneath it, I could hear a rasp, rasp, rasp sound. It was like metal grinding against metal, but it came high, then low, then middle, then high. The sound was growing fainter. I peeked around the corner, wishing I could remove an eye and use it to peek, so I wouldn't need to risk my soft, squishy head. But I had no options. The corridor beyond was as dimly lit as the one I stood in. Red light shone through grates and diffused through thin clouds of steam that emerged from machines whose purpose was entirely beyond me. That red light partially illuminated a humanoid, feminine figure. They were naked and I could see the faint drip of their sex between their legs. It pattered on the floor in a silent fall, the juice clear. Some part of my brain said arousal, not anything else. That fact was tucked away in the back of my brain adding to the exquisite horror of the rest of her body. She had the breasts and ass of a Vegas show model, both firm and perky. But her skin had turned a dull gray and had been colored a demonic red by the lighting surrounding her. Her shoulders had been augmented and expanded by a pair of almost machine-like growths that smoothly fused with her skin. Each one fanned outwards, creating a kind of skeletal pair of inverted wings, which were folded up behind her back. Other pieces of biomechanical fusion dotted the rest of her body, from the sleek tubes that she wore as dreadlocks to the digitigrade mech walker legs that had become shapely, and oddly sensual despots still having bare metal and flesh rubbing against one another. The final detail was her tail, emerging right above that perfect heart-shaped ass. It was long and segmented and tipped with a sleek metal barb that reminded me of the catching claws on the security drones. That was what produced the rasp noise, 
scraping along the wall and grinding against the floor as the woman walked. Oh, they all sold, didn't they? She whispered. Daddy, do you think I'm pretty now that I've sold out too? She moaned, sounding almost ecstatic. Yes, right, Daddy, Uds. She purred, her tail slashed at the air, as if she was impaling some invisible being before her. Some instinct surged through me. I stepped around the corner and put four bullets in her back. The bright flashes revealed more grotesque detail of how metal and woman met and became one. They drew attention to the rubbery, eraser-like hardness of her nipples and to the fact that her face was achingly beautiful, even when framed by mechanical dreadlocks and bearing a pair of camera-like irises. She stood there, blood dripping from the holes in her back, more blood flowing from around her eyes like tears. Then she beamed, her teeth razor sharp. A new toy, she cooed. She sprang at me with alarming speed. I staggered backwards, fear locking my legs. I tripped, which saved my life. The woman stopped a foot away from me and let her tail thrust between her hips, the segmented sections grinding against her sex like a perverse combination of deadly lance and sex toy. The barbed tip plunged through air where my chest had been moments before. I leveled my shaking hands at her and shot her in the chest again. The bullet thudded home and I saw her flesh mold back around the hole. She giggled, then coughed. She moaned, then opened her mouth, her long tongue lolling out. Like a slut showing her partner that she had all his cum in her mouth, she showed me the five bullets I had fired into her. Then she let them dribble out of her mouth, bouncing off her breasts, rattling onto the floor. Sorry, I don't swallow, she purred. She grabbed my pistol, then tossed it aside. Then her digitigrade legs whirred as they bent, almost in half. She was leaning over me. Her clawed hand cupped my breast. Her touch lit me on fire. My skin burned and my nipple ached as I moaned quietly. She leaned forward and her cold lips pressed to mine. I could taste a kind of spicy, peppery flavor and a metallic tang on her tongue as it plunged into my mouth. I moaned as I realized I was tasting my gunpowder on her lips. Her tongue grew longer, longer, longer. My eyes went hooded and my toes curled against my nanites as my throat bulged. The fullness of her tongue made my head spin as I realized that her tongue was starting to thrust in and out of my throat as if she was throat fucking me with a cock. I grabbed at her shoulders and I weakly pushed. She drew back, her tongue still deep in my mouth, her eyes glowed and whirred as they focused home. Stop, I thought. I tried to breathe and realized I couldn't. Uh, I was dying, uh, I was dying and I didn't even care. Her tongue had blocked up my throat and my nose flared, trying to breathe in, but all I felt was pleasure as I serviced her. My back arched and I realized I was coming. The sensation was shocking, fast and eager. It burned through me and I quivered as I spurted my juices along my thighs. My nanite clothes whisked it away, leaving me feeling faintly unsatisfied with being dry as a bone. My vision was growing dimmer and darker around the edges, infernal red light making the woman into a demon from hell as she spread those biomechanical wings wide. Yes, she purred. I'll make you part of me. How do you feel about being a tit? How was she speaking, I realized. Her tongue had broken free. It was in me now, a thick mass of biomechanical tentacle disconnected from her. Sudden revulsion burned through me, and the pleasurable haze of her hypnotic eyes and sensual body faded. I scrambled at my throat with one hand. <coughs> oh yes, yeah, struggle. I love it when they struggle, the Tesk woman purred. Machines of flesh, steam or water. I lifted my arm. I aimed the pistol at her. She laughed, then opened her mouth like a woman accepting a cock. I angled my pistol up and the last two bullets went off and smashed into the steam pipe overhead. Gouts of hissing, screaming water shot from the pipes, slamming down into those spread biomechanical wings. The woman screeched and sprang backwards, but that only got her further into the cloud. She started to spasm and jerk and twitch, her arms jerking and moving in jagged motions. I felt the detached tentacle in my throat deflate slightly and rolled onto my belly. I vomited up what felt like a mile of machinery. I coughed, hacked, and spat blood from where it had cut my throat and mouth. I closed my eyes and gasped in air, breathing desperately as the screeching stopped, leaving only the crackle and spark of electricity. I looked back and saw that the steam had condensed into a puddle, and the pipe had shut off the flow, detecting the suit and loss of pressure. The Tesk woman still sparked a few times, her body twitching, 
I panted, then pulled my wrench. After checking to make sure that I was using the rubber handle to insulate myself, I hooked the woman, dragged her out of the puddle, and checked her neck. You okay, lassie? Lucas's voice made me almost leap out of my skin. Yes, I rasped. I need to find a medical facility. It hurt too much to continue talking. Set. There's one near the engineering bay you're heading for us. What are you doing? I might have no memories about myself, but there were strange fragments that bounced around my head. One of them was recognizing machinery, understanding how they worked, and I recognized one of the limbs of her wings. Now that I was no longer being strangled by her, the woman whimpered as I stepped behind her, grabbed the wing, then ripped. She whined loudly, her back arching, and I blinked as I saw her pussy spurt juices onto the floor before she relaxed back onto the ground, eyes still closed. I hefted the shotgun that she had fused to her body. It was slicked with a kind of slime, and when I cocked the chamber open, I saw only a red glow from the interior. It shimmered and rippled with a kind of unearthly light. I snapped it shut, then turned and fired a blast down the corridor. My ears rang, and I swore loudly. The reverberations made being strangled seem pleasant. When the sounds faded, I checked the shotgun. It still had a glowing red light inside. Infinite ammo, huh? Well, uh, I hear the test co-op are tech, Lucas said, his voice sounding distant and tinny thanks to the ringing in my ears. Makes sense they do it our bloody guns. Gonna finish her off? I looked down at the unconscious Tesk woman. I hefted the shotgun up, frowning as I did so. I wasn't sure if this would even work. But if she wasn't awake, maybe her ability to absorb damage would be dimmed. Then my brow furrowed. Why do they look humanish? I asked, lowering the shotgun. She's... Well, there aren't many pure Tesk left, Lucas admitted. That was Maria Festios. She was one of the engineers before. Well, one of the hellhounds got her. He sounded bitter. Can she be helped? Not by us, lassie, Lucas said. I frowned. Then I shook my head. But not by no one. I slotted my shotgun into my backpack, testing to make sure I could yank it free in a hurry. I turned and started for the engineering bay I needed to get to. Lassie, you can't just... Watch me, I said, my voice firm. The station may have gone to hell, but, but I sure as fuck wasn't. Once I got out of the steam rooms, the dark red corridors and the humid heat nothing that I was about to miss, I found that engineering was constructed remarkably similarly to cryonics. I was aware of curving corridors to either side of the main corridor that led into the center. That meant if my mental map of the station was right, it was another ring based around a central plus shaped crossing. But unlike cryonics, engineering was big. The main corridor I was on was easily twice as wide as the main corridor in cryonics, and it led into other rooms, each one labeled with stenciled lettering. It seemed I was going through part storage right now. So, Lucas, I whispered. Can you hear me, I asked after he didn't respond. Lucas? Sorry, he said, trying to crack into the data files on the cores are, uh, the cryo-stored persons. He chuckled nervously. I pursed my lips. Any luck? Well, CyroCrypt0451 was listed for one Beatrice Montenegro, Lucas said. A trillionaire heiress waiting for her shot at the family fortune. The listing here says you were to be on ice until your older brother cacked it. If you are Beatrice, I frowned. It seemed like a somewhat trivial reason to put oneself into cryogenic storage and slumber away the decades, letting the world tick by underneath you, allowing everyone you knew to get older and older. I tried to remember the kind of life someone named Beatrice Montenegro would live. I tried to picture it, and faint images seemed to haze around my mind. A sunny beach, a large, beautiful ship that cut through the waves of an emerald blue ocean like a knife. A beautiful woman walking towards me, wearing a string bikini and suntan lotion. Her breasts bounced and swayed, and I found my mouth growing moist at the thought. But the image blurred before she undid the top and lowered herself on me. But I couldn't think of a name. Hell, I couldn't even think of a planet. Was that Earth? How many planets do people live on? I asked, quietly. Excuse me, Lassie, Lucas asked. I paused at another junction, making a note. So another difference between engineering and cryonics. There were two rings that circled between the main corridors. 
I looked down the left corridor and saw the doors were more widely spaced, and they weren't just slapped up with the same storage room labels as I had seen elsewhere. I frowned. This was actually where people got work done, if the first label I saw was true. Webtech Lab 39. I don't remember anything, I said, shaking my head. But no, I remember fragments, pieces. How many planets do people live on? Am I remembering Earth or, or, a name floated to my mind. Mars. Three, Lucas said. Four, if you count Luna. And the loonies sure want us too. I nodded. Mars, Earth, Luna, Venus? Dusties, shorties, loonies, and gas bags, Lucas said dryly. I snorted quietly. So Mars doesn't have beaches? Lucas's snort spoke volumes, so that memory had to be on Earth, or a remarkably large resort on Luna. But this was all pointless. Virgil Station was the only place I should be worrying about, and the only thing I should be thinking about in Virgil Station was the damn station keeping jets. But my mind kept skittering back to the image of that boat, to the idea of Beatrice Montenegro. Was that me? What was a trillion dollars even worth nowadays? My finger went to the collar of my throat and, wait, I whispered. Thinking of money made me think of things. Thinking of things made me want to compulsively check my gear. I pulled my shotgun out of my backpack, cocked back the pump. Still a red glow. I pulled my pistol and checked the ammo, still seven bullets. My brow furrowed. Lucas, I said, how many times did I shoot the Tesk in the steam rooms? Pretty, the voice echoed from the corridor behind me. Not enough, Lucas hissed. We have an hour to get that station-keeping jet on. Get your bloody arse moving. I nodded. Which store room was it again? I asked. Oh, 08. We started to jog down the corridor at storeroom 08, placed neatly between two Matek labs. Whatever that meant, I had no idea. Didn't open. I tried the keypad, but my fingers couldn't get to pry it open. I pulled out my wrench, but hesitated. Lucas, I said, if I smash the keypad open, then we get more of those fucking drones, don't we? Yup, he said. Listen, I'm checking who had authorization to that door. Dr. Thanton does, and he worked in Mattech, not in these labs, but in Lab 98. That's on the other side of the ring from where you're standing. I did some quick mental math. The clock was still ticking, but dying would mean I'd never get the fucking station-keeping jets online again. And so, I stepped back from the keypad and started jogging again. My nano-clad feet padded softly on the floor and I started to breathe lightly not needing to gasp or pant. It seemed that Beatrice was in good shape, at least. I smirked at that thought. Running past lab after lab, I counted the numbers as I rushed by, ticking up until I reached the 90s. Then I slowed, my feet thumping on the ground as I stepped slower and slower, finally coming to Mattec 98. The door was shut, but when I tried it, it hissed open with a loud clunk. I leaned around the corner and peeked within. The inside of Mattech 98 looked as if the people within had simply left during a busy workday. There were several machines clearly designed to hold and test chunks of metal. I could tell, because several chunks of metal were suspended in metallic claws that themselves were surrounded by pale blue panes of glass that looked designed to contain and withstand a lot of energy. The chunks of metal all looked similar gray and flat. But as I walked into the room and my view shifted, strange rainbow-like patterns started to appear and vanish as my perspective slipped around. I bobbed my head left and right, then up and down. The patterns never repeated. The melange of red, blue, purple, yellow, and other hues was endlessly different. It was nearly hypnotic. I tore my eyes from the metal panes and looked at the rest of the lab. There were several desks that were studded with control consoles. There were lots of toggles and touchpads, a curious combination of what felt like cutting edge and ancient technology. I noticed that the toggles were all labeled not by stenciled lettering, but rather by pieces of white tape that had been scribbled on by someone's black pen. Our modulator 98's L field on induction. What the hell did this lab do a scientist? And no need a sent to eyes. Me from on as I stepped past the desk and looked deeper into the room. Here, I saw another one of those corpses. It looked like another woman, her clothes shredded, her body splayed out over a chair, her hips thrust into the air. 
She had started to turn stiff, but there was no sign of rot. White tusk seed dripped from her pussy. I walked slowly around and saw that her mouth was wide open and a tentacle was still thrust into her throat. It was similar to how I had almost. I shuddered. Dunno, Lucas said quietly. You don't know? I asked. Listen, lady, Lucas said as I knelt down, checking the tattered remains of the woman's clothes. I found a key card in a scrap of a pocket. I tugged it out and saw the woman's face on it. It wasn't just a key card. It was an ID card. I looked at her face, then at the twisted mask of pleasure that it had become in death. I shuddered and stood as Lucas continued to speak. My only job on this bloody station was to keep the chicken soup dispensers operating properly. I don't know a single thing about any of the research other than bloody rumors. Like what? I asked, stepping towards the door. I heard a faint sloughing noise behind me, something slick and faintly erotic, like a member sliding from a well-fucked pussy. I spun around and saw that the dead woman had gone limp, slumping onto her chair with a boneless finality. The back of the chair had pushed her gaping mouth shut, her throat no longer bulged. I pulled my shotgun from the backpack I wore and cocked it once. I put it to my shoulder. There was only one place where the thing could have hidden. Behind the desk, the woman had been splayed at. I stepped forward, giving the desk a wide berth. I heard a faint rattling noise, my belly filled with ice, and my heart thudded in my ears. My whole body seemed attuned to the world around me. Then Lucas spoke and caused me to jerk with surprise. Well, like the fact that I hear they were dragging Tesk into. The tentacle dropped onto my head from the ceiling. It carried itself down on a filament of wire spooling from the tongue-like tip, or maybe it was the fucker's ass, while the rest of the mass wrapped around my neck and squeezed. I grabbed it and gritted my teeth as it started to strangle me. I couldn't get the shotgun against it without risking blowing my own head off. I surged backwards, falling against the main control console. My palm slapped down and several toggles flipped. The metal in the testing chambers started to rotate as searing white light shot from the wall. Lasers or something. I hefted the shotgun one-handed and shot out one of the chunks of glass. The spread of shotgun pellets blew out the glass with a spray and a crackling sound. And then the metal gave way and the laser beam seared across the room. My vision was starting to turn black around the edges. The tentacle squeezed tighter and then yanked against me and I saw that the filament in the ceiling was spooling back into its fucking ass. I swung myself forward and brought the tentacle against the laser. The air filled with the hideous smell of burning plastic mixed with the acrid scent of crisp flesh and scorched hair. I yanked myself the other way and fell on my back as the tentacle hit the ground in two halves. I panted. Ow, I rasped. You okay, Lassie? Lucas asked, sounding concerned. No, I whispered, I am most definitely not. The woman's corpse was writhing. Her hands twitched spasmodically and then closed like claws around the back of the chair. Her eyes opened and they were shot through with milky white cataracts. They bulged slightly and her forehead rippled and then I saw her lift her rump in the air. It was like she was presenting. My stomach twisted and despite myself, I found my pussy lips growing moist as the undead woman, for there was no better term for it spread her thighs, reached down with her free hand, spread her sex, and then peeking from within her sex came something pale silver and smooth. A moan crossed with an unearthly groan came from the undead woman's lips. Her eyes closed and she focused, shuddering. The shape pushed further out, revealing that the bulbous head led to a segmented bony spine. It slapped onto the ground with a wet sound, like meat. But then arms emerged from the bony head and the long spine, pushing itself up like a humanoid creature. It opened a segmented jaw and swung its eyeless, hideous face around. The woman cooed looking at it, her white eyes filled with a maternal love. My stomach twisted. The small creature sprang up onto her back, its clawed hands reached around, cupping and squeezing those gray breasts. Its small fingertips pinched her nipples, causing her to moan as it hissed and pushed its still slick body along her back, smearing her shoulder blades with her own juices. Her pussy started to spread, but that was impossible. 
Her belly was flat as a board. But as I watched, it started to swell, and swell, and swell. By the time the second hideous creature had emerged, the first had swung its tail up and over its head, curling itself into a shape that resembled a tightly coiled six. The tail tip pressed to the undead girl's mouth, then plunged home and she sucked, her tongue swirling around each bony ridge of the tailcock. She had given birth to it, and now she was sucking it off as earnestly and eagerly as a lover. And the second one crawled onto her, squeezing and caressing her thigh, while a third started to peek from her pussy again. Her belly squirmed with them. There were so many, but they hadn't been there. The third landed and it was bigger than the others. Rather than merely having a spine with four legs emerging from it, it actually had a torso that grew larger and more defined as it stood on its hind legs and stretched its spindly arms outwards. Those spindly arms became less so as it flexed and twisted. Flesh seemed to come from nowhere, ballooning with its chitinous flesh, pushing the plates outwards, filling tag apps within with muscle and gray skin. By the time it was done, it was a eyeless humanoid with the body of an athletic killer and a flat, nearly featureless cock that hung between its bony thighs like a weapon. Its tail whipped from side to side as the smaller ones continued to caress and stroke the undead woman. The eyeless humanoid looked at me and, and its cock was hard. Lassie, Lucas whispered, his voice low, Lassie, you better do something. My hand shook as I grabbed my shotgun, that tentacle. Holy shit, that tusk infested woman, Maria Festios, she had wanted to turn me into that, into a brood mother, and her brood was already walking towards me. It had no eyes, no face really, save for those dripping, segmented jaws, but somehow it still managed to exude a palpable aura of dominant masculinity. Its clawed hand reached down, fondling its sleek cock. My hands were frozen, my eyes locked on that member, it was so clear, just lean back and let it rape me. It'd feel out so good. I clenched my jaw. Sorry, buddy, I hissed. But you gotta take me out to dinner first. The words were stupid, pathetic even, shouting into the wind, screaming into the void. But the quip, no matter how weak it was, caused my hands to move. I swung the shotgun around and aimed it right at the brood's chest. I pulled back on the trigger, and the buckshot caught it right in its spindly chest. Chitin and gray blood went flying, and the brood fell in two pieces, flecking its mother with its blood. Her face twisted, and a combination of horror, sorrow, and rage played across her undead features. She howled wordlessly and pointed at me. The smaller brood, the broodlings, scrambled off their mother, ceasing their duty of caressing her breasts and tonguing her ass and every other perverse thing they were doing, and started scrambling towards me. My hands were more certain now. I cocked and fired, catching one broodling in the face, the other one skimmed by several of the shotgun pellets. It staggered as its sibling turned into so much paste. I cocked the shotgun again, pushing my feet along the ground, my back pressing against the wall as I desperately tried to gain more distance. The broodling screeched and leaped at me. I fired again, and the gray blood splashed me this time. But now the broodmother was on her feet. She moved with jerky, spasming motions, as if she was controlled by a series of rods and wires rather than flesh and bone. She twitched towards me. I grabbed onto the control console and toggled on the laser. The broodmother walked through it. Her torso hit the ground. Her legs kept walking. And under the char, I could see glowing growths more in common with deep sea life forms than anything inside a human being. Her torso kept crawling forward, howling at me. My babies, my babies, she screeched. I stepped backwards out the door then slammed my palm down on the lock button. I turned and ran and ran and ran and ran. Storage room airweight's door opened onto my panting, shuddering form. I turned, slammed the lock button down, then saw that the room was filled with crates and other storage units. I dragged the biggest crate I could, my arms straining, my muscles nodding with the effort, and pushed the crate between me and the door. With that done, I sat down and ducked my head forward. I panted, my shotgun clattering, as I dropped it onto the ground beside me. Fuck! I hissed. My babies. Moans of pleasure at the feeling of a brood passing out of my cunt. I shivered. My hand dipped before I could think about it. My fingers pushed against the nanite sheath covering me, and the nanites were so obliging. It felt as if the suit had wanted me to do this since I put it on. It grew tighter around my nipples, firmer around my breasts, clinging to me as I plunged two fingers into my cunt. 
I bit down on my lip hard enough to taste blood. It wasn't to keep quiet. I didn't care about quiet. I moaned loudly as my tongue darted out, tasting the blood. I shivered and panted as my thumb rubbed my clit, my fingers crooking inside of myself. The nanites slipped out of the way, letting myself touch my own center of pleasure. In my mind, the brood had me pinned down. His hips were rough and metallic, his hands squeezing hard enough to make my hands and fingertips go numb. His breath was moist and tasted of iron and gunpowder as he plunged into me again and again, that cold dick filling me as he raped me. Ha, huh, yes, 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 I moaned, loving the way each word made my cut lips ache. I needed that pain as much as I needed the pleasure. My eyes screwed up shut. I could have teased this out for hours, but I just let the crashing intensity of my climax hit me like a battering ram, the last image in my mind birthing another brood, another brood that would fuck me just as good as his father had. My back arched and I shuddered and puddled, my back pressed to the ground as I laid back, panting heavily. My butt had scooted forward with every finger thrust, my hips driving forward to meet my own fingers. This had ended up pushing me away from the wall and into the middle of the room. So now I was there, spent and twitching. My fingers forced into my mouth and I licked and slurped and sucked. Oh God, oh yes. I let my hand slap onto the ground. What the fuck is wrong with me, I whispered. Post-adrenaline rush? Lucas asked. I closed my eyes. You stopped watching, right? I, uh... Lucas coughed. Listen, Lassie. My face burned at his tone. We need to get back on task. There should be spacesuits and the parts we need in this room. Get searching for a case with a Starburst logo on it. I stood with shaky, quivering knees. Finding the spacesuit was easier than finding the right components, and I was painfully aware of the fact Lucas was watching my every action and thinking of my wanton need earlier. That need itself made my stomach do a slow flip-flop. The desire to be held down and raped by a brood was gone. The very thought made me sick to my stomach. But for... I shook my head. No, it wasn't worth worrying about. Instead, I tried to just focus on getting the suit on. The spacesuit wasn't actually a full suit. It was a pair of boots, a pair of gloves, a helmet, and a sleek backpack. I swung the backpack on, strapped on the boots and the gloves, and then slipped the helmet on. The helmet clicked onto my collar and the backpack started to thrum. I breathed in, then out. Will this be enough to keep me safe in space, I asked, my hands sliding along the sleekness of the nanites. It's a mechanical counterpressure suit, so basically the nanites will cling hard enough to keep you from getting any damage while being exposed to the vacuum. I nodded at that, then looked around at the boxes. There were several with sunburst images on the sides. I opened them, finding dozens of parts within. Describing each one to Lucas took a few moments of searching around for a number or component symbol. Again and again, Lucas told me that was the wrong component. Finally, though, I found a cube of metal, roughly a foot by a foot in size, with the designation of 45M Dex. That's it, Lucas said. Now we just get to the exterior hull and attach it to the busted up engine, and we should have enough time to catch our breath. I nodded slowly, then lowered the cube. And we're going along the exterior because vacuum is better than going up against Mortesk? That lass with the... A brood mother, I said. Ah, good name, he said. Well, there's at least 30 of them in the habitation deck. I found some working cameras. They have them in. He gulped. Well, ah, that's something you don't see every day. I nodded. So we've got possibly hundreds of brood and broodlings. Something like, Lucas said, sounding faint. And other Tesk too, I said, rubbing my helmeted forehead with one hand, shifting the helmet backwards ever so slightly against my collar. I bit my lip. Then I shook my head. Come on, I gotta get to the airlock before Maria Festios tries to make me one of them. Why call her by her name? Lucas asked as I shoved the crate out of the way of the door. I tensed at the door, cocking my head forward, listening. I didn't hear anyone scrabbling at it, but I still hefted my shotgun, keeping it at the ready. I need to remember she's human, I murmured, so I stay human too. Lucas coughed. He didn't sound convinced. 
The door opened on an empty corridor and I left the storage room and started for the outer edge of the engineering section. Bugger. Lucas and I spoke at the same time. Some of his verbal mannerisms were rubbing off on me, though I wasn't about to start calling myself Lassie. It felt too much like being a dog. I lifted one booted foot and kicked at the airlock door, its hand had still refused to budge. The airlock was the heaviest looking door I had seen on the station thus far, and had its own power systems, rather than being connected to the system's power supplies. The only problem was that the pair of tube-shaped power units to either side of the door were dead. Can't we hook it into the station systems? Problem with that is, the Tesk have control over some of the computers, Lucas said. I'm staying out of anything vital and hoping they don't try and fry my brain with some magic computer virus or some shit like that. But we hook an airlock in, the station vents, tests don't need to breathe, Lassie. And you think that our destabilization problem is bad, just wait until we spray half the station's atmosphere out of a bloody airlock. I nodded. So how do we... do we fix it? No. I don't know if there are any Voltic cells in the storage rooms. We were running short before all hell broke loose. Lucas said, sounding like he was chewing on his lower lip. Then quietly, he said, There's a rumor I heard. Yeah? I asked, breathing slowly, trying to calm myself. I checked behind myself. No sign of Maria, or Brood. I looked back at the airlock. I heard that one of the researchers, Dr. Tilly, he was able to recharge voltaic cells just by touching the blighters, Lucas said. It may be worth a shot. Maybe he has a charging unit that no one told us about. I clenched my jaw. How much more do I need to fucking fetch on this fucking station? Lucas chuckled, sounding wryly amused. Oh, I don't know. Enough to keep us alive, Lassie. I nodded. How much time do we have left? Twenty minutes. I turned and started running again. Dr. Tilly was located in Webtech Lab 01, and so I only had to run about thirty seconds before reaching it from the airlock. The door was shut. By this point, I had it up to fucking here with fucking around. And we only had 15 or so minutes left before the station's drift was unfucking fixable. And so, I pulled my wrench, smashed open the keycard scanner, then touched the right cables together. I didn't even worry about how I knew to do that. I just did it and I walked into Webtech Lab us or one. The scene inside was stark. Dr. Tilly, his name printed on this ID tag hanging from his collar, hung from the ceiling. A noose made of computer cables and wires bound together by tape and knots hung around his bulging throat. His eyes were closed, and he swayed slowly from side to side, his feet brushing against the chair that had skidded to the left. It was clear that he had stood on the office chair, then pushed off. I tore my eyes from him and spotted a small PDA sitting on the desktop that dominated the room. The walls were sparsely covered. In fact, I noticed that huge machines had been torn out of this place at some point, leaving behind scraped metal floors and torn out screws and other examples that people had stripped the place. I picked up the PDA and tapped it on. There were a few files, but since time was short, I tapped the first one, hoping to find something. Anything that might help me figure out what to do next. To my shock, the upper edge of the PDA shone to life and shimmering rays of almost solid light flashed out. They skimmed through the air and sculpted shapes that grew more and more defined, becoming the three-dimensional images of Dr. Tilly and two other scientists. They were adjusting and manipulating the now absent machinas, leaving me with only vague ideas of what they had once been. There were plenty of dials, but also lots of those sweeping gestures people made while using touchpads. Dr. Tilly laughed, his hologram stepping through his own corpse with a sickening whirr and dazzling spray of pixels. He reformed as he said, Ma'am, Subject 008 has given us just what we needed. Do you think the focusing aperture is ready? One of the other holograms turned to face him. The face was unfamiliar, but the woman seemed preppy, pretty, and eager. She adjusted her glasses one-handed as she nodded. It should be, Dr. Tilly. All right. I think it's fair that I take the first dosage of mass-produced ambrosia. Dr. Tilly said, flashing a grin. Are you sure, corporate? The other woman, a more severe, dark-skinned one, Usk asked. 
Dr. Tilly waved one hand. They've been getting naturally collected ambrosia for 40 years. I doubt they will begrudge a model employee testing their product. He chuckled, then picked up something the holographic recording suddenly picked up. Now that he held it, the syringe appeared in his hand. He touched it to his neck, then pushed it home as the other scientists watched. Both of them looked utterly appalled at the sudden motion. Even the preppy one who cried out, Sir, we should have set up safeties, we... Dr. Tilly gasped. He staggered backwards, his eyes closing. His mouth opened, and he seemed to grow... younger. I hadn't noticed the differences until they faded away. The wrinkles around his eyes, invisible in death, faded in the holographic recording as well. His hair grew outwards, and his palms spread as he clutched on a table that had been moved between the recording and now. He seemed to lean on nothing as a nimbus of crackling lightning surrounded him. He laughed, then opened his eyes, and even in the hologram, it was clear they burned with lightning. It's glorious, he whispered. The recording ended. I saw the title was Testing Ambrosia Lightning. I frowned. Did you see that, Lucas? I did. The bloody bastards were right, he said. They were making mass-produced ambrosia. That shite's an urban legend, Lassie. A kind of youth serum combined with fucking superpowers. I never bought the powers, but some of the uber-rich they never got old, you know. I was already starting to search the desk. I found that there was a silvery box containing a series of racks for syringes. All were gone save for one. It had a pale blue color and a small lightning bolt on it. I picked it up and hesitated. Do we know if this will work? I asked. We have eight minutes, Lassie, Lucas said, and bloody security drones are on their way. I nodded. We slammed the syringe into my neck. Pleasure. The most intense pleasure I had ever felt. Even better than that squirting orgasm I had felt ripping through my body when I had fingered myself. It started not in my cunt or at the tips of my breasts, but rather surged throughout my whole body like a kettle drum being being beaten. I fell to my knees and screamed in pleasure as my palms slapped against the ground. I arched my back and bucked my hips, gasping and ducking my head against the ground. Fuck, fuck, I hissed as I felt the need to have someone come and rut me. Take me. Do anything they wanted. Just fill me. And then, light poured from my mouth. It didn't go in a straight line, but rather leaped out and then splashed along the ground like a liquid. My eyes widened, and I realized that it was actually a crackling stream of lightning. Stop intruder. The sound of the drone behind me sent me spinning around. I slammed my palm outwards, and a lightning bolt smashed into the drone, causing the pleasure to fade and the energy to stop pouring from my mouth. The drone shuddered, sparked, and then fell onto its strange wheeled side. I panted raggedly. Five minutes last, I forced myself to my feet. I started running, but a dizzy spell hit me in the middle of the corridor. I sagged against the wall, then pushed myself away from it. I forced myself to run, my feet pounding along the ground. Keep going, Lassie, Lucas whispered. You are running amazing for someone who just had their bloody genetic code rewritten. I got to the airlock door. I put my palms to the emptied Voltaic power cells. I closed my eyes and let energy surge through me again. This time, I felt like I came dangerously close to passing out, my ease whiting out as my knees went to rubber. I sagged against the door as the airlock started to cycle it with a low, groaning noise. So, using energy used, energy, no shit. Pretty, pretty, pretty. Ut. That hissing voice. I looked back. Maria was standing at the end of the corridor. She was flanked by two of the brood. They both hissed, nuzzling against her like eager lovers. One caressed her biomechanical thigh with its spined, dripping tail. Maria grinned. Fetch, she whispered. The brood started towards me. The airlock door slammed down, leaving my back press set against nothing but air. I scrambled backwards and then slapped down on the airlock controls. The doors whirred shut with a loud clunk. They sealed and clicked as the brood scrambled at it. I forced myself to my noodly knees as the airlock door cycled. The brood drew away from the window, and Maria's horned, unearthly beautiful face filled the window. She blew me a kiss and I barely resisted the urge to return it as the airlock doors behind me opened and I pushed myself out into the infinite blackness of space. Four minutes, Lucas said, his voice crackling in my ear. I tried to turn around and felt the backpack hiss and click against me. 
I swung around and saw out of the corner of my eye a tiny jet of gas spraying from my shoulder. So it wasn't just air but also movement. Linked to the nanites it read my desire for movement in the tension of my muscles and the motion of my legs. I saw the huge sweep of the earth below me. It seemed so far, so beautiful. My brow furrowed as I saw the huge hurricane that was slowly heading towards the east coast of one of the continents. I could see the blood-red lightning crackling through it. Then I shook my head, forcing myself to task. I looked up at the station, and from the outside, I saw that Virgil Station was built like a wedding cake. The bottom, Cryonyx, was the smallest ring. Each ring above it was larger by almost a half, meaning that the habitation ring was by far the most massive. That hung above me like a continental shelf. My helmet blipped, and a glowing icon appeared on the upper edge of the habitation ring. That's where you need to be, Lassie. Remember the time you spend accelerating, that's how long you need to decelerate too, Lucas said. I nodded, gulping to wet my dry throat. I focused, then tried to make a jumping motion. The suit registered the motion, and the backpack I wore hissed loudly. I started to shoot upwards. A small distance tracker appeared next to the icon, counting down in a numeral I didn't recognize. The only thing I could hear was the sound of my own breath, the thudding of my own heart. At the halfway point, I swung my legs around and made the same jumping motion I had before. I started to slow. Two minutes, Lucas said. I slowed. I stopped. The damage to the engine was hard to see at first, until a shifting of the station's position brought a bright pane of sunlight around to shine on the darkness. Then I saw the jagged hole, the blackened metal. Fortunately, most of the energy had been directed outwards so the station's internals hadn't been too damaged. I reached into my pack, pulling out the foot-wide cube that was apparently going to fix this. How the fuck do I fix this engine in a minute thirty? Throw the cube at it, Lucas said confidently. You're kidding, I whispered, but my arms were already making the motion. The cube tumbled forward, turning around and around. Then, about a foot away from the damage site, it ballooned outwards. Gray goop flew into the hole in the blackened material and swarmed forward. I felt a sudden flare of heat, the gray material turning a bright cherry red. I lifted up my palm, concealing the image and slewing myself to the side. When I lowered my hand, the metal was cooling and a perfectly functioning station-keeping jet was thrusting from the side of the station. My eyes were wide. Holy fuck, I said. The engine flared to life. The station started to shift slightly. It was a slow, subtle motion, but it was there. Good work, Lassie, Lucas laughed, and I could hear him clapping. We'll make a tech out of you yet. I laughed raggedly. I knew that this was merely the first step. A way to save the Earth, to buy us some time. But even without Virgil Station raining down on it like an asteroid impact, I knew that the Tesk were an immensely dangerous threat to everyone there, to me, to my family, to the woman in my imagination. I slowly smiled. But don't call me Lassie anymore, Lucas, I said. Oh, he asked. I chuckled. Call me Beatrice. The airlock doors cycled shut, and I let my head sag against the wall for a few moments. The feeling of no longer being dangled over a pit was something I was going to revel for a bit. Seeing the Earth had really crammed the importance of what I had done to me. Virgil Station was no longer in an unstable orbit. It was no longer going to plunge through the upper atmosphere like the fist of a furious god. It was no longer going to smash into one of those massive blue-blue oceans and create a tsunami the likes of which our poor planet hadn't seen for centuries. But that left one big question. What now? Lucas asked. His voice crackled in my ear, loud in my helmet. I grabbed said helmet and yanked it off, breathing the station air. I had gotten into the airlock that was on the second level down from habitation. Lucas had said that it was PSYOPs. What does PSYOPs do? I asked. It's a fancy term for rest and recreation, Labe. Lucas corrected himself. Halfway. My brow furrowed. Bay? I'm not calling you Beatrice. I'm not paid by the syllable. Lucas said, sounding dry. PSYOPs has a lot of recreational shite. Immersion rooms, some restaurants, a null G pool, that kind of stuff. But it also has some working food dispensers if you're getting hungry. At that, my belly rumbled. I made a face. Way to remind me, I said, pushing away from the airlock wall. I'll get something to eat and we can work out what to do next. 
The airlock doors opened to reveal a broad, welcoming corridor. The walls were painted a pale blue, and the ceiling was decorated with slowly moving cloud motifs. The lights were bright, and yet not harsh. Instead, they diffused a warm, yellowy glow through the whole place like sunlight. The only problem was that rather than a soothing breeze, the air was filled with the fetid stench of rotting meat. I gagged and put the back of my hand against my mouth to try and block it out. What is that? I whispered. <laughs> I don't know, Bay. Last I heard from Psyops was that the Tesk were fucking everything up, like they did on the rest of the station. I nodded slowly, then stepped back and grabbed my helmet. With it snapped back into place, I could only smell myself. But the memory of the scent clung to the inside of my nostrils like a fine film. I wanted to blow my nose. Instead, I walked forward and past several doors that led into open meeting rooms that had a wistful, forlorn air to them. One had a rotting meal set out beside a bench with a book dropped on the ground. Another had some clothes left behind Hoover had been changing or naked inside had run off and left them behind. A third had a single severed hand, still clutching what looked like a baseball bat. That had been bent in half. Then I came to an intersection, more like a courtyard actually. It was two stories with the wraparound balcony overhead leading to yet more stores and rooms. The lower level had three fountains in the middle. Each one was choked with bodies. Feet faced me and arms were placidly laid across backs. Heads were forced under the slowly burbling water. Hair floated and tangled together like chunks of seaweed. But the thing that made me want to scream and scream and scream and never stop were the shoes. Fifty, maybe sixty sets. Neatly taken off, paired off, then set to the ground. Almost a hundred people had walked in here, quietly taken off their shoes, then as a group, jammed their heads into the fountain. Their bodies had started to tighten and rot, and I could see the faint squirm of bugs underneath the skin. I stepped slowly back. Jesus, I'm what I whispered. Tink, 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 the sound, not unlike a piece of bone rapping against a metal wall, echoed from the mall. I gulped. Lucas, go through the networks and find the security footage of this place. Find out what happened. I backed towards one of the stores, a large, cheerful sign overhead announcing that it was a Temple Soft Toys for Tots store. The interior showed large, squishy stuffed animals in neat rows on shelves, their button eyes looking out at the mass suicide with clear curiosity. There were several blocks strewn across the ground, each one unmarked. I stepped over them carefully, but my nearness caused one to whir and open up, revealing it was a multi-modular playset. It started to construct a replica of Virgil Station and play a cheery tune. Checking, Lucas said. I crouched down near the corner of the room and tried to get my breathing under control. The tink 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 noise was growing closer. My ears filtered some of the echoes out, and I breathed slowly in and held the breath. Tink tink tink. It was coming from above me, whatever it was was in the balcony right overhead. I looked at the ceiling, trying to gauge the thickness of it. Then I heard a quiet sigh, a very human sigh, as bizarre as that sounded. Then the tink 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 faded away. I remained still for a few more minutes, letting my heart rate slow. I think it's gone, I whispered. Still working on the camera footage, Lucas said. Keep at it. I stood and walked forward. Oh, I love you. I screamed and leaped away from the shelf of stuffed animals. A large teddy bear was looking up at me, its eyes shining as it cocked its head. It spread its tiny arms. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. I lowered my shotgun, panting heavily. Fucking. Lucas, these are smart toys, aren't they? You're big and smart, the teddy bear said. I am not actually a person. I'm just a toy. Ah, uh, those fuckers, Lucas muttered. Teddy Fazbear fucking scared me even when I was a kid. I shook my heat at the beer. I'm not a child, I said. The shotgun and space suite gives it away, doesn't it? The teddy bear nodded solemnly. I am sorry, but since you are an adult, I can tell you that the Teddy Fazbear semi-sentient talking bear toy is a perfect toy for a new mother. He sounded so cheery I could almost forget the pile of corpses outside the store. We can help take care of your baby and tell you if anything goes wrong. All yours for only 300 United Nations credits. But you get us 50% off using TSPN. TS... What? I asked. 
TempleSoft promissory notes, Lucas said casually. The longer you work with TempleSoft, the more your TSPN to credit ratio goes up. Mine was at 1.5. If it was at 1.2, I'd have quit this bloody job. I shook my head. I was starting to think it was a good thing I didn't remember Earth. I turned away from Teddy Fazbear and started for the door. Achieve death, Beatrice, Teddy said cheerily. And I spun around and used my shotgun to bash the bear off the rack. I stomped its head and felt the flimsy plastic endoskeleton crunch under my nanoclad heel. I smashed my foot down again and again and again until it was nothing more than a mangle of metal, wires, crystal, and smoldering fur. I stepped it away from the mangled mess, then glared around at the rest of the store. Any of you Elsie want to say creepy shit? I snarled. The bears were silent. Once I came into the mall again, I looked for a map and found it, blown up big in the corner of the room. There were several dozen TempleSoft brand restaurants. I headed for the nearest one, taking a broad corridor. I would have been more comforted to find signs of battle or other haunting reminders that humanity had once thrived and walked through this place like the population of a small city. Instead, I walked through a corridor so utterly clean and litter-free that it only accentuated how busy this place should have been. My mind drifted back to those shoes lined out, as if everyone was going to get out of the pool. Instead, maggots were eating their fat, chewing underneath their skin. A convulsive shudder tried to crawl from my ankles to my forehead. The next mall had no fountains. Instead, it had what looked like a jungle gym that had been designed just big enough to make adults think they might be able to play on it. But there was a glowing blue fence surrounding the false grass that the gym was built on. The shimmering letters that slipped and twisted along the blueness made it clear. Kid Zone. Vore children sat on the swing sets and they were all dead, but it took me a few seconds of looking at them to figure it out. I saw the tiny bloody dibbles coming from their ears as I walked a circle around the blue fence. I stepped hesitantly over the fence, but it didn't set up an alarm. I came closer to the corpses and saw they too were slowly rotting, their bodies stiff. I saw that each one had a set of footprints in the grass behind them, leading to one of the cafes I had planned to eat at. My eyes followed the prints and I tensed. Four people sat in the cafe at a round table. They were stock still, but their skin didn't look drawn and grayish. They breathed. They were alive. I walked forward, my shotgun at the ready, and the door hissed open and let me into the cafe itself. I was so glad for the helmet. It made me feel secure, even if it was only a thin pane of glass and plastic. I could breathe myself and not the rot of the corpses of children. The four people were a mixture of genders and races. A black man, a white woman, a pink-haired androgynous person who could have been anything, and an older Asian woman with a strong, mannish chin. They were seated stock still, their faces blank, their hands clasping teacups. The liquid within looked like it had cooled and concealed into a muck that was as drinkable. As I stood in the doorway, I saw the face of the white woman's face was streaked with tears. She breathed in ragged breaths, her hand shook with tiny, barely perceptible motions. Suddenly, each of the people pulled out tiny things. The white girl pulled a screwdriver. The tip was black and studded with hardened globules. She put it into the cup and stirred it. The Asian woman had a knitting needle. The black man had a pen. Each one was caked with gore. Ah, uh, I wanted to throw up. He's coming, the white woman hissed. Kill us, the black man wheezed. He sounded like he could barely get the words out between his lips. Tick, tick, tick. Run, the pink-haired androgen whined. Tick, tick, tick. I stepped backwards, then ran out into the mall itself. I tried to tell where the ticking sound was coming from, but it seemed to come from everywhere. It had been on the second floor back in the toy shop. Run, run, that was what the pink-haired one had said. Run. My mind flashed to the people drowned in the pool, the killed kids. I turned and I ran my heart in my throat, panic rushing through me. Whatever that thing was, it had made people kill themselves and each other. If it saw me, who knew what? My legs staggered, I fell and planted my face on the ground. The faceplate crunched, but the crack sealed itself up. My legs felt as if they had turned into solid stone. I panted, grabbing at the floor, and now my hands were locked in place. Tick, tick, tick. The sound had slowed. My eyes rolled around, 
looking desperately for the source of the sounds. But then the ticking stopped, and I felt every muscle in my body twitch. It wasn't instantaneous. Rather, it started at my eyebrows and worked its way down my head, to my neck, to my shoulders, along my spine. Every muscle group I had twitched and wriggled and settled. My toes wiggled in time, and then my back twisted, stretched, and I pushed myself to my feet. My muscles weren't moving because I wanted them to. Instead, they pushed and tightened and stretched themselves, leaving my brain inside my head, screaming. I walked back to the cafe, grabbing my helmet and yanking it off. I breathed in the scent of corruption and filth and smiled brightly as I walked to the table. It wasn't my smile. Lass, what are you doing? Lucas hissed. I didn't respond. I sat down at the chair, my palms pressed there. I tried to fight, desperately, as I looked at the black man. My lips moved, despite every single thing I tried to do. I could feel my lungs dragging in air, pushing them out. What was natural and normal became painful, as my diaphragm compressed and the words formed, my tongue twisting to form them. Do you have a nice big fat black dick? I asked. Beatrice, Lucas shouted, and the man, tears glinting in his eyes, nodded. Of course. I smiled and stood. My hands went to the collar of my suit, undoing it. The nanites slithered away from my body, splattering onto the ground with wet drops, as the controlling force that kept them in place was removed. It felt like solid mud being peeled off my body, my nipples hardened, and I felt a shameful blush rush through my whole body. The task that was doing this didn't suppress the blush, because the telepath hadn't needed to tweak and twist my body to get my nipples hard to get my sex moist. Being exposed to the four people, the three others, were all looking at me, their faces blank, their eyes filled with sympathy. We all knew what was going to happen. The black man was also dressed in nanites, but they had been coded to look like a rather nice three-piece suit. When his collar came off, the clothes seemed to freeze. Jagged lines of black formed across the white and gold hues of the suite, as if it was on a screen whose channel had changed unexpectedly. Then the suite began to fall away in pieces, revealing sculpted muscle and ebony dark skin, glistening with sweat. It was as if he had been struggling for days to move, to do anything. And that wear showed, even if he walked over languidly as a panther. His head was bald, and he had a sleek circle goatee shaved around his mouth. He looked dignified and sensual, even naked, even with eyes filled with pain. I tried to force out words. I breathed them. It's okay. His hands cupped my breasts. They were so very warm, I shivered and hissed queerly, my ease half-closing as those dark fingers found and tweaked my nipples. Please your tingle it and buzz it along my body. My back arched without me wishing it, pushing those breasts into his hands. Jules, he whispered. B. I whispered back through clenched teeth. Then his hand smacked across my face. It was sudden and hard enough to send me sprawling to the ground. For a moment, I thought that the telepath had let me go. But I realized with a sinking feeling that that was the furthest thing from the truth. It had orchestrated my fall with the same grace and poise as a movie director. My body was as under control as it had ever been. I fell in exactly the pose the telepath wanted with my thighs slightly spread, my face twisting into a look of confusion. My lip bleed sluggishly, and my tongue moved under its whims, licking along the stinging cut. Jules stepped forward, his cock hardening. It was long and thick, and my head spun with his closeness. I breathed in and for once didn't smell the corruption and rot. He whispered, barely audible. I'm so sorry. His cock slapped my face. It was gentler than his hand and yet felt infinitely more humiliating. The thickness of his shaft left an impression against my cheek, and I felt hot pre-dripping along my neck. My breasts ached, wanting to be touched, but instead I whimpered and my voice forced out words. I looked up at him, trying to show with my eyes, as I spoke to the telepath's script that I didn't mean what I said. J. Jules, don't, please don't. His hand grabbed my hair, his fingers and strong and firm, clenched on my hair, and I felt the roots tug at my scalp. Tingling, buzzing pleasure shot along my spine despite the pain. Or maybe it was accentuated because of the pain. But my begging, pleading words were cut off, 
cut off by Jules shoving his thick cock into my mouth. My throat opened for him and my eyes locked on his, and as my tongue twitched against the underside of his cock and his balls slapped my chin, I felt something shocking. I, I was feeling good. It wasn't from any physical stimulation. The telepath could move my muscles, but it didn't seem to do anything to my brain, to my soul. And my soul buzzed with the happiness at the fact that in this sick, twisted moment, I could give this man something. It was nothing next to what he had been forced to endure, what he had been forced to do. But it was a tiny flicker of physical pleasure. And the telepath couldn't take that from me. My tongue swirled around and around his cock, my hand closing around the base of his cock. I was no longer quite sure if the telepath was pushing me to do this as I bobbed my head and Jules squeezed my hair roughly. His hips bumped against my knuckles and his ball slapped my chin. Fucking bitch, he snarled. The words too loud, too unforced to be real. I ignored them. Suck my dick. Bitch, I'm gonna skull fuck you. The slick want between my legs grew more insistent. Then Jules' cock slipped from my mouth. I gasped loudly. Please, I whispered. His hand shifted, pushed my head backwards. The cock leveled at my eye. My eye widened, and the look of terror on my face was slapped there by the telepath. But it really didn't need to be. Don't, I begged. That cock slipped against my cheek. Then Jules shifted to the side. I felt a moment of relief. Then I felt his cock pressing to my ear. Don't, he hissed. His cock tip pressed gently against the hole of my ear. My fingers tightened and my brain raced. There had to be a way to get out of this. But everything I did, every single muscle in my body, all of them were controlled by the telepath. Jules bumped his hips back then mashed his cock against my ear hole. The pressure of his member made my ear ache and I heard a quiet hiss of pain shoot through Jules. Pain. Maybe pain would... His cock smashed again and I whimpered, my eyes filling with tears. My ear rang with the impact and I felt something hot and wet drip from my ears. Please don't, Jules snarled. Stop it. Pain didn't stop it. He was hurting. He had hurt worse when he had slid that pen into his own kid's ear. What? His cock pushed a tiny bit further in. The ringing in my ear became a scream. My eyes screwed up tight. Electrical impulses. That Nerves were electrical and the new ability in my body wasn't a muscle most humans had. I had one shot. I looked down through a blurring mass of tears at the ground. Tile flooring, not metal. It'd have to work. I breathed in deep focus through the pain and let my electrical pulse out through my palms. Lightning surged along my body, crackling and popping. Jules' whole body tensed, and the hair of his goatee stood out like porcupine pins. He tensed, then fell backwards, the bleeding tip of his cock flecking my cheek with a mixture of fluids I tried to not think about too hard. But I was slightly too focused on the pain of the lightning surging through me. Some of it had pulsed through my muscles transmitted through the hand on my scalp and the cock in my ear. That connection was gone, and the pain faded as I wiggled my fingers, then slumped forward. I gasped. Jules was sitting up, groaning. Tick, 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 tick. The sound was receding, though it was hard to tell I could only hear out of one of my ears. The telepath was fleeing, but as I tried to get my body to rights, I saw the three others stand up and march towards the back of the coffee shop. As they walked mechanically towards the back, Jules managed to rasp out. Stop them. I pushed myself to an unbalanced, uneven stance. My inner balance was entirely fucked. I took a step and the whole world spun around me. I staggered to the back of the coffee shop, and I saw the three other controlled people were standing before a blender. The older Asian woman had already turned it on and was calmly reaching for it, her fingers so close to the blades that skin was coming apart and blood flashing against the edges of the glass. I lashed out with my left hand. Lighting surged, then shot outwards and smashed into the lot of them. They writhed, twitched, then collapsed to the ground, smoking slightly. As they lay there, I gasped softly, trying to ignore the pain aching through my ear. The warm fluid dripping down my cheek, the fact part of me was still kinda horny. <laughs> then the old woman whimpered, she put her hands over her face. Why did you stop me? She gasped between racking sobs. Why did you stop me? 
blocking off the entrance to the Temple Soft GameStop for entertainment store was as easy as upending a tacky plastic statue, pushing a few metal shelves around, and finally, closing down the blinds. If it can't see us, Jules said, panting as he stepped away from the covered window. I don't think it can control us, but you scared it the fuck of. I've never seen anyone other than corporate using Tesh. I smiled at him, then cocked my head. What? I asked, play loud. It was a terrible joke, and everyone burst out laughing at when I sat down next to the others, the pink-haired girl. She had clarified that by introducing herself as Marisa, was sitting next to Amanda and rubbing her shoulder. The white girl was Tracy, and she had drawn her knees to her breasts but was keeping herself from crying by whispering under her breath. First, I'm going to find out how many legs it has. Then I'm going to break them, one at a time. I'll let them heal. Then I'll break them again. Different this time. Then it starts on the death march. I looked from her to Jules. He had gotten his collar back on and used one of my nanite tubes to rebuild a suit. Simpler than the three-piece suit, just a white shirt and jeans. He looked... I wasn't sure how he looked. It was a mixture between completely devastated and faintly amused. He forced the devastation away, a wry twist to his lips, only accentuating his handsomeness. He had the most curiously angular face I had ever seen. So we've told you our name, he said. What's yours? You from Aztec? I shook my head. Cryonix. My name's full name is Beatrice. He whistled softly. You're one of the corp burr, one of the cryogenics? What is your deal? He looked curious. I don't know, not really, I said, shrugging. I winced as my ear continued to ache. Anyone got a med kit or something? Tracy cut out of her increasingly detailed monologue about what she was going to do to the telepath and looked at me. What's wrong? She paused. Oh, right. Your ear. She moved forward and then looked at my ear. I had jammed a chunk of cloth from my backpack and wrapped it into place with a bit of nanites. I wasn't sure why the healing side effect of my nanite suit hadn't kicked in. But Tracy leaned close to my collar and tapped a switch on the back. The nanites on my chest shifted slightly against my skin, then projected out a holographic interface. Tracy worked quickly, tapping buttons and moving symbols around. I worked as a doctor, she said. The suit self-repair is set for minor shit. This is going to be cold, but it'll repair your eardrum. I smiled. Thanks, Tracy. Don't thank me, she hissed, her face twisting with rage. You couldn't have showed up a fucking week ago when I was feeding my kid crushed glass? I flinched. Jules put his hand on Tracy. It's not Beatrice's fault, he said. It's that thing. I nodded. Lucas, you still there? I asked. Oh, holy shit, you know Lucas, Jules asked, sounding shocked. I frowned. He seems to be incommunicado, maybe hacking into the security camera footage got him caught or something. The telepath doesn't work through computers, but the station's AI was co-opted by the Tesk when they broke containment, Jules said. By the way, the full name is Dr. Jules Verne Delacroix. I work in heresy. Heresy, I asked. Sorry, in joke, I work in physics. We were disproving so much accepted scientific maxims. General relativity has been taking a beating, that if we had released any of this shit on the open networks, Jules said, chuckling softly, well, we'd be branded as heretics. How can... Tracy's eyes bulged. How can you fucking laugh, you... Jules shot a glare at her. I can laugh, and his face twisted. Because goddamn that fucking thing isn't going to break me. I'm going to laugh and enjoy life, and I'm going to mourn Jeremy when it's dead and I can dissect it. But despite his words, his eyes brimmed with tears. His voice grew choked. He put his hands over his face. I was about to say something when I felt the nanites, which had been quietly creeping towards my ear, flow into my ear canal like a flood of ice-cold water. I gasped, kicking one leg. I'd have accepted far more pain for the effect it had on Marisa and Amanda. Apparently, my face was hilarious enough to make both smile. Jules slid his hands from his face. Still, where the hell did you get fucking X-Men superpowers, Beatrice? Or are the mega-rich really able to do anything? Tracy asked, her voice sour. I shook my head. I don't, I got them from WebTech, I said, the labs and engineering. Jules' eyes widened as he looked at me. You were in the weaponized Tesseract labs? 
My ease would it right back at him. I felt a suit and urge to vomit. My hands were up together. My heart pounded. No. That couldn't be right. Those labs were weapon technology. Right. But Julie's looked at me with growing horror, and I saw that he realized what it was, too. I scrambled to my feet, walking a quick five paces away. This brought me to a smiling poster of a store employee, the conversation bubble coming from his mouth telling me that I could buy anything I wanted, half off using TSPM. I grabbed the poster and ripped it off the wall with a snarl. I didn't inject fucking Tesk shit in me, I said, spinning around to face them. I didn't. Amanda looked as if she thought I was going to start ripping her to pieces. The fact she looked fucking hopeful for that made my belly clench. My skin turned clammy. I closed my eyes. I would not throw up. I shook my head and then started for the back of the store. Wait here, I snarled. Once in the back I looked for an inventory. My fingers needed to reach into some mechanical guts, and a cool, contemplative part of my brain was working through what I'd need to stop the telepath. The only problem was that there was no inventory, no piles of boxes, no game consoles for me to pillage. Instead, the rear of the store had a pair of fabrication machines and a single computer terminal. I tapped it on. A password screen balked me. My fingers shook as I tried to tap out a request for computer components. The computer screen turned red and informed me in a polite but firm way that another attempt to hack the computers would call station security. I snarled and felt lightning buzz along my fingertips. The urge to just blast this fucking thing into pieces almost overwhelming, but just as quickly as the urge came, it passed. I ducked my head forward, my eyes closed, my palms resting on the desk. I shuddered and felt hot tears burn along my nose and cheeks. They dripped onto the keyboard and I whimpered. I was scared of weaponized tesseract. I had injected that one into me. Hey, Jules' voice, a soft male burr, made me jerk my head up. I wiped off a smeary mass of tears and snot from my face, sniffing furiously. I tried to look presentable as I turned to face him. He looked like he was trying to be calm, but that just drew my attention to how tense he had to be. He stepped over to me. It's okay, he said. No, it's fucking not, I whispered. His dark hand cupped my cheek. I remembered the feel of him slapping me and forcing me to my feet. No, not him, the telepath. I trembled like a deer, ready to leap. But whether I was going to leap forward or sprint away wasn't clear in my head or heart. I looked into his warm, dark eyes as he murmured. It'll be okay, we'll get off this station. The tone of his voice drew a shuddering sniffle from me. I breathed up and felt my nostrils clear ever so slightly. I hung my head forward, letting his palm caress through my hair. The simple human contact eased some fears but accentuated others. I had put the needle to my skin. I had pressed the plunger down. Was I going to become like Maria? All bits and pieces and seductive intensity? The mental image of my body, twisted and made exotic and beautiful and terrible. Straddling Jules' face flashed through my mind. My cheeks darkened and I stammered. We will. And I have 500 TSPM, Jules said. What do you need? I'll buy it from the kiosk. I lifted my head. He drew his hand away from my head. I felt the ache of its absence. But that part of my brain that knew how to rip open key panels and rewire their innards started to whisper out components. I licked my lips and then stepped backwards. I looked at the dispensers and then looked at the part catalog some helpful corporate employee had hung up, just in case they had to fix one of their machines. I rattled off a few machines. Jules smiled and opened his mouth, and then he stopped. He looked desolate, a deep, dark desolation that crossed over his face and remained there for some time. He looked down, then turned and walked out of the room. Quick stepping, I wanted to grab him and hold him as tell him the same lie he told me it was going to be okay. When he came back, the fabricators were already whirring away. Whatever they did was hidden behind sheet plastic and blackened glass. The only thing I felt was the warmth of the machines when I put my palms on their sides, but then the first game consoles came out. Ripping them apart was therapeutic. Jules handed me screwdrivers and collected parts and listened as I let the words flow. 
It was technological babble that I only half grasped, but listening seemed to keep that wry smile on Jules face. And working on the new problem, let me not think about the problem after that one, and the one after that and the one after that. Tell me about where you're from, I said, picking up a clump of wires, realizing that I needed two hands for this, and tucked the wires gently between my teeth. Jules shrugged slightly. France, he said. I opened up a component then tilted my head. The wires were firm enough that I could at least get them settled. I looked at him, awkwardly, considering I was stooped over a mass of computer components. I grunted and he leaned forward, placing a single black finger on the wire tip, keeping it grounded. I let go with my teeth. You don't sound French, I said. Ah, do you want me to speak with an outrageous French accent? Wah, 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 wah? Jules asked, drawing himself to his full height. I snorgled, which was a noise I had never known I could have made. It was somewhere between a snort, a giggle, and a sob. Jules laughed and shook his head. Ever since the Caribbean Wars, there's been a lot of American expats in France, he said casually. Best way to get away from the killing fields. My family adapted, but Dad never did learn French. He winced as I picked up one of the soldering tools. The acrid smell of burning metal wafted to my nose, as sweet as perfume compared to the stench of the rest of the place. I smiled at Jules. Everything I hear makes Earth sound so much nicer, I said. I just remember. My mind flashed to it. The beautiful woman. Her bikini top slipping away. Her mouth pressing to mine. My cheeks flushed. What? Jules asked. I coughed, picking up one of the 15 batteries I had managed to yank from the handheld systems I had forced Jules to buy, emptying his account. There was something grotesque in dropping months of work onto entertainment devices that I was going to immediately rip apart and rebuild, while both of us were trying to not think about how fucking hungry we were. A girl, I admitted as I slotted a battery home. A cute one, Jules asked. Uh, I mean, do big tits count as cute? I shot back, trying to sound casual, my cheeks growing darker. Jules smiled at me. Girlfriend? I have no fucking idea, I admitted. Hope not. Or if she is a girlfriend, I hope she's open-minded. Jules chuckled quietly. If she's anything like my Marie, then she's seen at least one episode of Star Trek. His face fell, his mirth fading. What you do while under the influence of mind, or, ah, uh, body control in this case, isn't your fault. His voice grew soft. I put my hand on his shoulder. I felt the strength underneath, and the past few hours of near death smashed into me with the strength of the fist of God. It wasn't that I was worried about, I whispered. Julius looked up at me. His ease were confused. My hand slipped along his bald scalp, drawing back to his neck, and I dragged him up and forward. The soldering gun slipped back into its wear holster as my mouth and his met. His tongue filled mine and for a moment I didn't taste the scent of rotting corpses. I just tasted him. His black hands cupped and squeezed my pale white ass, and for some reason, that excited me even more. Before I knew it we were on the ground, his hands were tugging at my nanite uniform, tearing chunks aside. The nanites flowed off his fingers and back into the mass of clothes until I broke the kiss and rasped a quiet order. Turn them off. The collar, it turned out, didn't need any additional instruction. When Jules' desperate, seeking hand tugged the nanites off my breasts, they tore away like sticky paper, revealing my glistening, sweating skin and my diamond hard nipple. His beard tickled me as his mouth closed around the hard nub and he sucked. Hard enough to make me hiss. My back arched, and I whimpered. Oh, Jules. His mouth drew back and he panted. We shouldn't, but... Fuck it, I snarled, grabbing his neck again. I drew him to my neck, then pushed myself forward and down, so that my mouth and his pressed together again. His tongue was even more insistent now, and my hands reached down to his hips. I tore at his nanites and they fell aside, revealing more dark skin. I had felt his cock in my mouth. Fuck, I had felt it in my ear but it still took my breath away when my palms caressed and cupped his black dick. I squeezed it and his mouth drew away from mine. Be tritemony crooned. Fuck me, Jules, I begged. There was no other word for the desperate, hungry tone in my voice. My thighs spread as wide as they could, my hands grabbing onto his shoulders as I settled myself under him. 
There was no foreplay, no hesitation. Jules pressed his dick to the thin slit of my pussy, and while I was sure I wasn't, I felt like a virgin. I couldn't remember anything before, and the sensation of a married man plowing into me, filling me, fucking me, was so intense that it made my eyes fill with a white haze. My fingernails dug into his back and shoulders as I closed and locked my legs around his hips. Ooh, I whispered. You're so fucking tight, he hissed in my ear, his voice fraught with a complex melange of emotions. I could feel his tears drip onto my shoulder, but my eyes only saw the ceiling, looking past his head, my fingers caressing his back as his hips worked back then slammed home again. His black balls slapped my ass lightly at first, then harder and harder as he started to work up steam. The ground creaked underneath us, and I felt the first of my orgasms rushing towards me. My eyes closed and I moaned, wantonly loudly. But when I breathed in to moan again, my mouth didn't breathe in corruption and filth. I just smelled him. Jules planted his arms wide and started to use every bit of his sleek physicality. He was strong, he was flexible, he had stamina, and that stamina showed as his cock plunged into my hot cunt again and again and again, and he didn't come. I had already climaxed once, a dizzying sensation, but Jules didn't slow, didn't stop. He gasped, panted, kept thrusting. My legs remained tight, locked around him. I wouldn't have let him stop, even if he wanted to. Oh, Jules, I hissed. Ooh, gods, yes, don't pull out, don't, ah, fuck, don't pull out. I didn't know why I needed him inside me so badly, but I did. I needed it bad enough for it to hurt. The idea of him not dumping both ballfuls of thick white cum right into my womb made me want to scream. I squeezed him tighter and felt Jules shudder. It was convulsive and body spanning. His whole form locked up and his eyes went unfocused as his balls emptied themselves into my cunt. The hot rush set me off again and I moaned like a damn soul. I felt him fill me. I felt his cum in my womb. I gurgled unaccountably happy, my voice entirely deserting me as I clung to Jules. His arms grew weak and he sagged on top of me. The crushing weight of his muscular's body made me squeak, but then Jules rolled to the side. His cock slurped from my sex. He lay on his belly beside me, his arms resting before his head. His head turned to the side as he looked at me. Looking at him, he seemed to be almost like an African god. That was Guy whispered. A mistake, Jules said. Amazing, I purred. Jules was silent for a time, and then just as quietly as he had been loud before, he murmured, Amazing. I blushed hard, my hand going to my sex, feeling the ache of being well fucked for the first time in my life. Cum dripped between my fingers. Is Marie on the station, I asked. Yes, he said softly. And for all I know? I looked at him. My eyes softened. Dr. Jules V. Delacroix looked at me. His eyes were unreadable, but then he smiled slightly. Even if this was a mistake and we never do this again? He took my hand, then squeezed it. I... He paused. F fuck. How can something wrong feel so good? I shrugged, then leaned forward. I kissed his knuckles. Ask me again later, I murmured. I'm going to be testing to see how good murder feels. I sat up. I grabbed the device I had been working on. I snapped a final component in, then looped it around my neck. The electrical inputs pressed to my skin and I flicked it on, grinning. Test, I said. My body shuddered as a light electrical shock went from my neck to my toes, and I felt my muscles go numb, then relax. I chuckled. Now, I said, let's see if this can break a telepath's control. Julius sat up, watching me. Munchiri, he said, stopping me before I left. He smiled at me. Thanks. I saluted him, then left. There was a telepath to hunt. So how are you not going to be fucking that shotgun in five seconds? If Tracy knew that I and Jules had fucked while I had been making my anti-telepath collar, she didn't show it. Instead, all of her attention was on me, my shotgun, and my soon-to-be-coming hideous death. I imagined what it'd be like to have the barrel of the gun entering me, there, and shuddered, making a face. My collar started to vibrate softly against me, 
a gathering buzz, as if a storm was coming. Don't, I glared at Tracy, don't give it ideas. I sighed, then tapped the collar, my finger touching a small green button next to my throat. And this is going to keep me from being controlled, I hope. What is it exactly? Amanda sounded like she was starting to come out of her fuge. Quite clever, actually, Jules said, trying to sound cheery and not guilty. In the end, he merely sounded guilty. I knew, faintly, that he was married, and I knew that it was a bad thing to fuck a married man. But at the moment, the only thing I could think of was the fact that if I was going to die, at the very least, I wasn't going to die a virgin. Yes, I know. I had probably had sex before I had been put into cryo. But that... Did it count if you didn't remember it? I shook my head as Jules walked around to the side pointing at my collar. The collar puts a burst of electrical energy through Beatrice if she doesn't touch the button every, uh, 60 seconds. The collar started to vibrate again, I tapped the button again. So if the telepath controls me, I said, I won't touch the button, and then it shocks me. That seems to disrupt the telepath's puppetry. Tracy didn't look convinced. So we're going to stay here, Amanda asked. I nodded to her, then checked the shotgun. The glowing ammo cell within shimmered at me. I looked at Jules as he whistled softly. His eyes were locked on that glow. Well, son of a bitch, he said, man, where the hell did you get that? Found it, I said, biting my lip. Why, what is it? My eyes flicked down to my shotgun, back to him. It's a test power core, he said, then shook his head. I'll tell you more later, once the telepath is dead. I nodded. Right. It's safe, right? I asked, feeling goosebumps crawling along my skin at the thought of using a Tesk power core for anything. The fact it was going to be the primary way I was going to not get my skin peeled off. My bione fingernails didn't help either. Jules nodded and I turned to face the boarded up door leading out of the game shop. My finger tapped the collar, the motion already becoming second nature. Then... I started out into the mall once more, the thick stench of death still hung in the air. But my nose, by this point, had started to filter it out, in the same way my mind filtered out the need to tap the button again, and again and again. But it gave me a wonderful sense of time as I padded to the suicide pool. It took me two minutes, two pushes, and when I arrived my eyes saw something, something that looked off. But what was it? It clicked. Five corpses were missing. They had been slotted there, there, there. The absences were as clear as a missing tooth and a smile. I started to rack my brain, trying to remember which corpses they had been, as I looked around, checking the entrances to the open part of the mall, checking the floor. The shoes were gone, too. They had quietly gotten up and put their fucking shoes back on. Why did that make it 10,000 times worse? Lass? My heart exploded and I dropped a dead of shock, or at least that was how it felt. I almost fired my shotgun off into the ceiling and sagged against the wall, panting. Lucas, I asked. What the fuck, where the fuck have you been? Hacking into the computer systems of the most private part of the station, Lassie. He said, sounding annoyed. You wanted the security footage. I've been getting at the security cameras. There's some seriously mean stuff on the computers here. Things that would fry out my hardware. The last thing I want is to be trapped in a metal box without a computer. I frowned. You could have warned I sighed. Do you have it? I, I have it and it's not nice shite to what... Who grabbed the corpses from here, I said at the suicide pool. I added, in case he wasn't watching me directly. There was a longish pause. It was Maria, wasn't it? I asked. Nay, he said quietly. Though she has arrived, bet you wish you had cacked her now. Now something it wasn't in any of the cameras that came by and the corpses just stood up and headed for the adult section. I frowned. Great. The adult section of the mall was colored darker, richer hues than the rest of it. There was also a set of double doors that had been designed to keep children out via a combination of foreboding designs and a pair of gates that were swung shut against smaller individuals, but opened automatically when someone tall walked up to them. That automaticness of them was likely why they hadn't been torn to pieces by monsters at any point, and as they swung open, I saw that I was actually following a trail of sorts. Because someone had left behind a shirt, 
the icon on the shirt danced and cavorted before me, and I could almost hear the jingle that was supposed to go with it. Fruity Odie bars my aching ass. I scowled down at it, then muttered under my breath. How was it that being in cryogenic storage had wiped out all knowledge of my name, my past, everything about me, but I could still remember a fucking jingle for snack food? Lucas, you ever think that we gave corporations too much autonomy? A skittering sound jerked my head up. I saw the shiny, smooth dome of a brood, peeking around the corner at the far end of the alleyway leading towards the adult section of the mall. My heart stopped for a moment and I knew exactly which corpses had been taken, and why. Women. Women that could birth the brood, dead or alive. The brood jerked back just before I snapped my shotgun up. I tapped my collar by jerking my shoulder up against the button hurrying forward. The main lobby of the adult section made it quite clear why this was adult. I saw two Temple Soft Robo Brothels on the first level alone. I could hear the faint sound of whirring and gasps of pleasure coming from the one on the left, the male voice husky and deep and slightly artificial. The brood, though. No sign. The upper levels sold what seemed to be porn, but there was also an upscale restaurant place called the Safari which had a robotic fusion of a human and a lion, sculpted to look utterly gorgeous. The Marquis proclaimed, Disney night. My brow furrowed. Disney, where have I heard that? Dead Corp, their IP is up for grabs, Lucas said. Half the cameras here are smashed. The other half are linked right to the Templesoft black box folder for future blackmail, in case an employee self-terms. Was a what? I asked, stepping slowly forward towards the robo-brothel that had noise coming from it, shotgun aimed right at the door. Quits, Rears, Lucas clarified. The door hissed open, and I saw that the main lobby of the robo-brothel was tastelessness personified. Breasts and cocks were on display in gaudy, flashy terminals that were designed to draw the eye with quiet, purring voices that spoke up the instant the computers detected anyone looking at them. My eyes settled on what looked like a near-perfect replica of Fules' cock, and a voice pared in my ear via some trick of speakers and shaped rooms. Take Lance for a ride you won't forget, fully programmed for three eras. Indulge yourself on a slave's member in the 18th century, or maybe swing with a brotha from the 1970s. I jerked my eyes away. Gah! Made a face. Hey! Lucas sounded aggrieved. I heard that male voice again. Oh, baby! Then next to it, a hiss. I recognized that hiss. It was a member of the brood. I stepped up to the corridor leading deeper into the rober bothel. A pair of men who looked like they had been pinned to the floor. Their thighs spread, their anuses still dripping with pale white liquid. Their dead eyes filled with bliss, spread out between me and the only door that was open and had light coming from it. A shadow cast by that light showed a woman's form, her breasts bouncing her moan soft and restrained and somehow desperate. I hurried forward, stepping over the corpses, biting my lip hard enough that I almost bled. The room inside was the end of something horrifying, and yet I couldn't look away as I peeked around the corner. The woman was clearly held there by the telepath. I recognized the tightness of her muscles, the expression of confusion and eagerness alike on her face. She was poised over Lance, his massive black body writhing underneath her, his cock plunging into her again and again. His eyes were closed and, I had to admit, uh, it was a very detailed and accurate robot. His cock plunged into the woman's sex, spreading the pussy lips wide. Seed dripped around the member and from the way she trembled and whimpered, I knew she had to be there for a while. But standing to either side of her were the brood, one of them was the type I had seen before, sleek and segmented and hideously beautiful. The other was subtly different, smoother, longer head. And rather than a member like the first one, a tentacle emerged from between almost vaginal lips, between its chitinous hips. That tentacle spread outwards at the tip, fanning out into an almost conical shape as it caressed the woman's face. Her lips were skinned back in a Rita's grin, and her eyes were filled with terror and pleasure alike. I gaped, unable to move, my body locked into place, 
The only movement I made was the automatic gesture, tapping my collar. The tentacle pressed to her face, it sealed around her nose, her mouth, her jaw. Filaments spread outwards from the contact points, working into her skin, forming a growing spread of gray veins underneath her skin, growing towards her eyes, which rolled backwards into her head. Her back arched, and I saw her muscles growing slack. The telepath had loosed its control over her. Her throat bulged and gulped, gulped, gulped. The... the brood was feeding her something. As I watched, her skin tuned the same sleek gray as Maria had. Her breasts firmed and grew larger as her fingers pressed to Lance, then molded into him. The robot continued to fuck her, his hips moving less and less like a human's would. Her skin and his robotic facsimile started to merge, flowing together and mixing like chocolate ice cream mixed with vanilla. Her fingers vanished into his pecs as if he was a puddle of mud, her arms rooting into place as she started to writhe happily, her eyes closing. Her mouth was covered by the tentacle, but... But she sounded joyous. Her hair grew longer and braided together, sliding along her back into dreadlocks made of metal and glowing blue lines. Her skin grew segments along the shoulders and elbows, and she rolled her shoulders as ports on her back opened, and Lance Truro rattled. Pieces inside of him shifted, and then started to come out of her shoulders. A pair of mechanical manipulators, long and spindly and spider-like, stretched free, making her croon happily as Lance's arms twisted, clicked and pushed against the ground. He thrust upwards and... and... There was no woman, no robot. There was just one thing, a centaur creature with the black android forming the legs, his hands and feet pressing to the ground as if he was a contorted spider. His cock merged with her sex and started to slide up and down like a piston, her thighs and his merging together so smoothly that I couldn't tell one from the other, their skin tone matching, not quite as dark as Lance, not quite as pale as she had been. Her breasts were left exposed, hanging as she was hunched over him ever so slightly, her human arms merged with his chest. His head rolled backwards, and a massive black tentacle tongue thrust from between his jaws. From her posture, and from the way that his arms and legs twitched, that tentacle was their new cock. The brood who had brought this transformation about slipped the tentacle away from the woman's face, leaving her with a beautific smile white dripping from her gray lips. From the shadows Maria emerged. She caressed the new hybrid's face, her voice a quiet croon. How do you like it? The hybrid flexed all four of her legs, what had once been elbow joints twisted with quiet creaks. She giggled, her voice high and cheery. I understand now, she whispered. I love it. Thank you. Why did I struggle again? We were all fools, Maria said, caressing her chin. Welcome to the rest of eternity, sister. Then, gingerly, like a woman kissing her lover for the first time in centuries, Maria leaned forward and locked lips with the new hybrid. I watched, my stomach roiling, my cunt soaked, my nipples hard enough to cut glass in a sick, wanting need. I wanted to be that complete, but it was... My collar went off, electrical current surged through my body, and the confused desire that I had been feeling buzzed away from my brain, clearing out the musk and leaving me with only fury. I slapped my palm against my collar and snarled as I stepped around the corner leveling my shotgun at Maria and her new convert. The new convert hissed, drawing backwards, her tentacle cock withdrawing into her second head, which glared at me. Upside down, from between her thighs, what would be her thighs if they weren't some robot's arms? Hello again, Beatrice, Maria said. My brow furrowed. How do you know my name? I know a lot of things, Maria said, grinning. How's David doing? Who the fuck are you talking about, I asked the name crawling through the back of my mind. It meant something. I knew a David. The two brood hissed. The normal brood had longer claws, so I decided to call him a warrior brood, the one who had transformed the woman from human being to fucking monstrosity. Well, I figured if they could do that, the only good name would be a worker brood. His claws did seem to be smaller. Luke has nose, Maria Pared. Thu, I have a question for you. I resisted the urge to cock the shotgun I had already cocked it. How many bullets does your pistol have? Maria asked, 
her tongue elongating as she licked her lips, sliding down to lick each of her hard nipples, leaving them glistening. I smirked slightly. Enough. The warrior brood leaped at me. I shot it in the head. The head painted the wall with bits of brain and blood, and the worker brood hopped onto his creation's back, like she was a horse. The hybrid snarled at me, then drove forward. Her body smashed into the wall separating this brothel room from another, and the wall exploded inwards, metal screeching, sparks spraying from the torn and ripped cabling that had once provided power between the rooms. The next room over had five corpses, each one of them laid in a circle. Each one had fucked the other to death, literally five men, each with their cock in another man's eye, their bodies forming a perfect circle, disturbed only by the hybrid running away from me. The worker on the back looked back at me, but before I could draw a bead, Maria leaped onto me. Her hand closed around my throat, touching my collar. Her finger pressed the button curiously. I had once spared her. But that was while she had been asleep, knocked out cold, helpless. There was trying to stay human, and then there was being a fucking idiot. The shotgun pressed to her belly and I growled. Bye, Maria! I hissed. The shotgun blast took her and threw her against the wall, her hand releasing my neck. I hit the ground and gasped as Maria started to push herself to her feet, blood dribbling from a dozen puncture wounds in her belly. She shirked. No! She clutched at her belly, my baby! Eh, I said, leveling the shotgun as I aimed it at her head. Take it up with the telapth. I pulled the trigger and blew Maria's head off. I staggered back against the wall, panting heavily. Her corpse sprawled on the ground, and I felt a curious mixture of detached relief and, uh, deep sorrow. Fuck, I hissed. I wanted to save her. My eyes blurred. There taint much left to save, Lucas said, tick, tick, tick. I frowned. Over the sparking, over the distant clatter of the hybrid, over my own pounding heart and aching soul, I could hear that tick, tick, tick. That sound of the telepath drawing closer. I tapped my collar and started towards the hole. I paused, for a moment, Maria's words buzzing in my brain. My hand went to my backpack, and I shook my head. Not the time. Then I felt it. The control slid into my body like a wave of ice. My muscles locked, and my eyes went unfocused as the telepath made me drop the shotgun to the ground. It clattered and clunked, and my legs moved mechanically. I started counting the seconds in my head as I walked out and into the opening. The worker breed and the hybrid it had created were standing in the open plaza. The ticking sound that I heard came from above me. I didn't try to fight, and so felt light as a breeze as I was puppeteered towards the two. It, you killed her, the new hybrid hissed. My mouth opened and I dropped my backpack. My motions were slack and jerky, the telepath working sloppily. I wondered if it was scared of getting shocked again, or if it was upset too. The thought made me feel a buzzing sense of joy. Yeah, suffer, suffer you fuckers. Suffer for what you did to Maria, to this girl. She had been on that robot for how long? Weeks? She had been raped and broken, then raped again. My backpack hit the ground, but my hand pulled out the pistol. Make her explain, the woman snarled. Don't you know, don't you know what you are? The control on my mouth slackened and I looked at her with pity. I'm here to stop you. Then the collar went off. Pain lanced through my body, but I ignored it, spinning around and seeing the telepath. It was a hideous mashup of skull-like faces and bulbous tissue, clumped together into a mass not unlike a tumor given tendrils and clicking spider legs. Each leg was tipped with a curved blade. That was made, that tick, tick, tick noise. My pistol leveled on it, and it wailed in fear and confusion as I felt its control probing at me through the pain. I put three bullets through its body, painting the wall with blood. I spun around and fired another five shots into the brood. As it fell, the hybrid reared backwards, and the tentacle cock emerged from the second head. It shot towards my throat, the hybrid screeching in fury. I caught it with my off hand and sent every jolt of electrical power I could through her. Her backs arched, and she screamed from both mouths, then toppled to the side, smoking softly. As she sprawled there, I let go of the tentacle, panting. I failed Maria, and I whispered, I'm not fucking failing you. I took the collar and set the timer to an hour. Since, well, I didn't know when I'd run into another telepath. Then I knelt down, grabbed the hybrid, and started to drag her along the ground, swearing every step of the way as she clattered, thumped, and clunked. 
Oh God, Tracy whispered, her voice ragged on its Danielle. Jules and Marisa were working together to drag the corpses from the suicide pool to the morgue. Apparently, there was one on every level. That said a lot about Templesoft. Nothing good. I sighed as I checked the restraints keeping the hybrid trussed up in case she woke up, looking up at Tracy. Did you use to work with her? Yeah, Tracy said. We both worked in corporate, handling the orbital transfers between the corporate resorts. Her voice took on the faint monotone of someone who was just talking to be heard. We had one or two every few days, big people, rich people. They show up, they want to get here with minimum fuss and bother. You'd think that'd be a flip and burn, just straight there and there. But no, see, most of these pleasure yachts didn't have major thrusters. Why ever accelerate harder than 0.1 G? Cheaper and leaves more room for the fuck slaves. Did you meet me, I asked, looking at her? Tracy blinked. I don't... She paused. Wait, you said your name was Beatrice? I nodded. No, but Danielle did. She said, looking down at the hybrid. That was why she said she knew who I was, huh? I asked, frowning. Jules came back, puffing softly. They're being recycled, he said at my questioning look. But Marisa and I heard, uh, well, brood. He frowned. Not the big ones, the smaller ones. They're definitely congregating in the gardens. I groaned. That means warriors are going to be coming out soon. I rubbed my face and then stood up pulling out my pistol. Before I go, tell me about the Tesk power source. I want to know if it's going to crap out on me before I go throw myself at five broodmothers. Well, a quick version? Jules asked, looking nervous. The Tesk don't have time. That is, when we sent the probe into their dimension, it read that it was detecting temperatures at absolute zero and 5,000 million degrees, over the point where quarks stop being able to form. The Tesk don't have a tomorrow or a yesterday. Everything happens at the same time, constantly. Our artifacts sent into their dimension drag time with them. Small amounts in the case of the probe, large amounts when it comes to us. He sighed. So when? Seven bullets, I said, frowning. So when? What, one? he asked. This pistol has seven bullets, I said, frowning. It had seven bullets when I pulled it out of the locker. It had seven bullets after I fought Maria for the first time. It has seven bullets right now. I looked at him, my jaw tightening slightly. You said things, not people. Have less time. What? 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 Jewel asked, rubbing his nose. I held up the gun and then fired a bullet into the ceiling. It thudded home. I fired another bullet into the wall. The others gaped at me and Jules jerked away from the report of the gunshot. Then I discharged the magazine, holding it up. Seven bullets. I turned and hurled the magazine as far away as I could. It hit the ground and skittered around the corner. Then, turning back at Jules, I held up the gun, then aimed it at the wall and pulled the trigger. Another bang. I hit semi-automatic, he stammered, trying, groping desperately for an answer that wasn't what I knew it was. I pulled the trigger again, another bullet. The magazine was back in the pistol. It had never left. It could never leave. The gun had no time. It merely was stuck forever at the point that it had been in when it... And everything else on the fucking station was dragged into the Tesseract. Sam. I hadn't been looking at Earth at all, and I'd been looking at their homeworld. What do we do? Tracy asked. Lucas, I asked. No. We're fucked, lass, he said, causing the rest of the group to jerk in surprise. Lucas, you son of a bitch. Jewel exclaimed. You're alive? I'm stuck in a closet down in storage, but I, I'm alive, Jules, he said, sounding distracted. Listen, all my readings say we're around Earth, but I think that they're just detecting leftover... I don't know. Shitty that was dragged in with us. Or the computers are fucked. Either way, if we're in the Tesk Dimension, we're fucked. No, we're not, Jules said, his voice firm. We have the portal generators down in physics labs, and we have a fucking Tesk right here. He kicked the hybrid, which grunted softly. Her eyes were open and glittering. We can open a portal, target it right at Earth, and waltz out and leave this station behind to rot. I nodded and heard hissing. 
the sounds of clattering feet echoing down the corridors approaching our area. I frowned. Everyone, get the hybrid to the elevator, I said, snapping up my shotgun, my timeless ammo at the ready. I'll hold them off. How you're just one fucking girl, Tracy howled, fear making her voice screech. I fired the shotgun into the side of the fountain. Water poured over the chunk I took out of the lip, scudding across the floor, rushing towards the corridor leading from one lobby to this. Five warriors came rushing out, screeching as they sprinted at us. I lashed out with my left palm, and lightning slammed into the lead figure, then sparked along the water. Each one stood, their backs arching, their mouths wide in pain as lightning crackled along the water, surging and buzzing through their bodies. They all collapsed at nearly the same moment, a pile of corpses. I turned back to Tracy, that's fucking how I snarled. The four others gaped at me, then they turned and ran, grabbing up the hybrid who howled at me. You're gonna fucking die, you bitch. Yeah, I said, I heard that before. Then the brood were in the room. They skirted around the puddle of water. Fifteen of them, maybe twenty. And as I glared at them, I felt a slow, shuddering rage burn through me. They had abused women's corpses, perverted them in the most grotesque way just to breed more monsters to break and hurt and ruin and maim and kill. I trembled and snarled and felt my heart thunder faster and faster. Before I knew it, I was among the brood. I leaped away from some slashing claws, grabbed one of their heads and smashed it into the hard pavement that ringed the fountain. Their skull crumpled and I turned, then blasted one with lightning from my palm. I didn't get tired anymore, not with the lightning. The surge smashed into two of the creatures, sending them sprawling backwards. Then I felt claws slash along my back. I rolled with the impact, skidded between a pair of legs, and let the nanites slick themselves against the water. I fired once, twice, three times, pumping the shotgun mechanically as I blew brood in half, from the crotch to the head. As they hit the ground, I kicked out with one leg, sending a brood sprawling to the ground. I put the shotgun into his mouth and pulled the trigger. The kickback skidded me back against the wall. A brood lashed at my face. I ducked and metal shavings flew out into the air. I shoulder checked it as I stood, sending it sprawling into three of its fellows. I pumped and fired into the mass, the thump of pellets tearing through flesh giving me an aching feeling between my thighs. I pumped and fired again, then smashed jaws apart with the butt of my shotgun. Blood dripped from my face as I laughed, exhalting in their deaths. There was no moral gray area here, there was just ripping and tearing and snapping. I stepped onto a half-dead brood, my heel driving its head almost 180 degrees, then ducked under another one slash. I didn't know how I was this fast, but since I was standing on a corpse, I leaped upwards and fired a lightning blast right down. It hit the corpse, surged through the water, and electrocuted another half dozen of the fuckers. As they spasmed, I landed and felt the buzz of the remaining electrical currents, fading quickly. Three brood were left. I let the shotgun rest on my shoulder. Run, I said, my voice flat. The brood turned and ran off as quickly as they could scamper leaving behind piles of corpses and smoking bodies and severed arms. I shivered and stepped off the body I had been on, breathing slowly out. I looked around, and not since I had been roundly fucked by jewels had I wanted to smoke a cigar quite so bad. The need tingling through me, a half-remembered thing that I was fairly sure Beatrice did quite often. Damn, I purred on, damn, I'm good. The elevator doors opened. The other four gaped at me as I stood there, blood dripping from my face. I reached up and casually flicked a chunk of chitin from my shoulder. Jules shook his head slowly. W what are you, Beatrice? I looked back at where I had left the pile of dead brood, then back at him. I smirked. Their worst nightmare, I think. Come on, let's get you guys to physics. Us? Tracy asked, her voice tremulous. Yeah, I said, stepping into the elevator then tapped the button for physics. As the elevator started to rattle down, I leaned against the wall and tried to not notice how scared of me Jules looked. Then he forced that expression down and smiled wryly at me. Where are you going, he asked. Corporate, I said. Tracy said that one of her co-workers helped get me, or Beatrice or whatever, on the station. The computer says that I was here to wait for my brothers to die of old age to get the fortune, but I'm starting to doubt that story for some reason. Fair enough, Lassie, Lucas said. Again, ah, uh, maybe while you're down there, you can get me out of this closet and get me to the portal, too. I nodded. 
Can you get to the security cameras for physics? Sure can. The elevator ride passed in uncomfortable silence. Once the doors rattled open, though, we had something to take that silence and make it worse. For the doors opened into a corridor from hell. The walls were splattered with blood and the stink of rot was even more intense here. Firearms and spent shell casings lay on the floor, while dozens, hundreds, of dead brood were mixed with the Templesoft security and their drones. I walked slowly forward, shaking my head quietly. This is what Lucas told us to expect, I whispered. But it was one thing to be told, it's a right mess in there, and another thing to see it. This must have been where the first incursion started, Jewel said. If it wasn't my off shift, he choked himself off. Amanda was quietly sick, vomiting in the elevator. The hybrid, who had been set down near the dried blood, slid her tongue against the floor with a slow, eager lick, her eyes glinting with malice. Come on, I said. We made a queer band as we walked through the carnage and past the workspaces and labs that had been smashed and ripped and torn to shreds. It was clear that this place was less hard-nosed than engineering. There were no actual prototypes here, just computers, all of them designed to run simulations of physics problems. There were a few labs for doing actual experiments, but those had been smashed up the worst of all. But while the security forces had wheeled out the heavy weapons here, the brood had hit back with stranger things. We walked past a bulbous gun-like biomechanical throne, one that had been fused to a quartet of brood, turning them into a kind of legged wheel for the thing. They were canted to the side, the weapon split almost completely in half by an equally slagged artillery laser that some enterprising security officer had fired off before being raped to death, his eye sockets still bubbling with Tess cum. The amount of this battlefield that is basically an orgy is really fucking creeping me out, I whispered. The others nodded. Then we came to the central lab and I whistled quietly. The portal that had been used to open the hole to the Tesk dimension didn't look scientific in the least. It looked, rather, like the collar of my nanite suit, ballooned to a size large enough to make the runic inscriptions on the inside easily seen, rather than faint impressions. Its cyclopean size, combined with those runes, made it seem like some ancient artifact, one that should be steeped in blood and sacrifice, not in scientific equipment. Corpses had been heaped around it, most of them wore scientific gear and bore faintly shocked expressions, even as their bodies putrefied. I breathed out, trying to breathe shallowly and through my mouth. Okay, I said, turning to face the others. What do we need to get this to work? Julius, his eyes hardened, his shock worn away by endless horrors, pursed his lips. The power's off, Tracy said quietly. The computers are slagged. Jules said, nodding. So we need power in a new computer rig, I said, nodding, and a Tess's biological matter, which we got. I kicked the hybrid. The hybrid snarled at me. Don't snarl at me, Danielle. We're going to fucking fix you if I have to drag you into the Temple Soft lobby and start shooting people until they get fucking doctors. I'm touched, she purred, her eyes flaring with hatred. I'm sure they'll listen to you immediately, you fucking sleeve. I ignored her, looking at the others. There should be computers in corporate, right? Tracy nodded. Not as strong, but we don't need a full supercomputer for this. You have the basic calculations, right, Jules? Jules nodded as well. Be but how do we stay safe? Marissa asked. I got an answer to that, Lassie, Lucas cut in. For fuck's sake, my name is Beatrice, I shouted at the ceiling. Sure about they? Lucas asked, his soft accent somehow making those words feel and sound even worse. I shuddered and closed my eyes, trying to not break down at the thought. I shook my head. Call me Bia, I hissed. Are you okay, so what's the solution? Lucas led us to them while Marisa and Amanda started to clear out bodies. Jules, Tracy, and I all whistled in almost the exact same tone as we found what Lucas had spotted with the cameras. A pile of brood had piled up around a corner. There, four automated turrets had been set up by a terrified-looking engineer. With the corpses piled before him, he had quietly taken out his pistol, shoved it against his temple, and pulled the trigger. His corpse laid there, sprawled. But his turrets continued to tick from side to side, whirring so softly that we hadn't heard them till we got close. 
They used all their ammo, Tracy said. I stepped over the wall of bodies, grunting as I hopped down. I grabbed onto the ammo container, then popped it open. Thousand of fresh rounds gleamed within. I slapped the container closed again as the turret word left, then right, then left. I looked at Tracy and smirked. Hey, I said, there's a silver lining in every cloud. The elevator door opened on golden gilt and blood. I stepped out, shotgun in hand, and looked around the corporate section of Virgil Station, my lip curling slightly. I wasn't sure what disgusted me more. The gaudy art deco designs of the walls, with angelic figures holding aloft the ceiling by Uptr's palms, like recreations of Atlas, or the Bodies. It looked as if a good fifteen people had been caught by the tesk and flayed against the walls, their Bodies spread out, their skin stretched. Nails had been driven through palms and ankles, but their faces were turned away from me, as if ashamed of themselves. The floor itself was covered in maroon carpet. I hoped it had started maroon, but I doubted it. Testing, testing, Jules said, his voice crackling from a speaker mounted above me. It sounded tinny and distant, much less clear than Lucas's pure brogue. I wondered if corporate had worse speakers than the rest of the station, or maybe being splattered in someone's head, blood really fucked up a speaker's sound quality, either or. I can hear you, Jules, I said walking cautiously past the flayed bodies and through the double doors that led away from the elevator lobby and into the first area of corporate. Since this was where visiting bigwigs came first, it was designed to be just as impressive as the elevator lobby. A curving wood panel desk that had clearly been made to be staffed by concierge, like at a massive hotel, bisected the room, while huge vaulted windows showed space and earth beyond. Except now, the light of the sun had shifted and the clouds had moved, and I could see that the ground wasn't green and brown, as I might have expected. Rather, the planet was wreathed in red. What I had mistaken as a hurricane was in truth a firestorm the size of a continent, sweeping slowly across that hellish landscape. I shook my head slowly and turned away from the windows. The rest of the room lacked the gory decorations of the lobby, but a stranger thing started to nag at me. Where are the statues, I muttered. What? Jules asked, his voice coming from a nearby speaker. We're not getting any of the security footage. Lucas, have you? Lucas, his voice pure as an angel, chuckled. If I had, laddie, I'd have sung out. I shook my head and walked over to one of the gaping holes in the decoration that had clearly once held one of those Art Deco abominations. It didn't look as if the statue had simply torn itself free and marched off. Not that impossible, not here. Rather, I could see a few dozen massive gouges that had been left on the wall, and a series of deep furrows on the ground. I knelt down, tracing parallel lines, trying to do some guessing. I held up my palm to compare the lines to my fingers. Whatever had left this track had to be either five buzzsaws moving in perfect unison, or alternatively, it had to be the biggest goddamn tesk on the station. If they had captured the middle of the station, then spread outwards. Corporate would have been the least well-defended areas. The people here were white-collar assholes, not security. They'd fall fast. So the Tesk would have had plenty of time to... work. What do we know about the Tesk ecology, I asked, for lack of a better word. Almost nothing, Jules said. They don't have the concept of linear time in their dimension. I'm not sure if we could even say they have ecologies, or evolution or any kind of interactions that we could recognize. But well, I was under the telepath's control for some time, I made some observations. You don't need to, I started, wincing at the pain that roared over that crackly speaker. Lassie, do you want to die? Lucas asked, his voice pragmatic. Seems to me that not knowing shite is a great way to end up in some... Lucas, you asshole, I muttered as I hopped over the counter. Checking behind, I found a few key rings, each one with a glittering golden key on it. Ostentatious dickheads and I took each key, shoving them into my pack as I crawled along the ground. My knees rasped on the carpet as Jules sighed and started to speak, narrating over me checking drawers, rummaging through cash registers, picking through anything that might be of some use. The tests take human bodies and manipulate them, he said. I don't know how, but that much is obvious. Certain human females are turned into brood mothers. They are able to birth 
Through some kind of dimensional process, the brood, broodlings assist them. Likely, the combination of modified human tissue and broodling structure allows for more complex support, machinery, if you can call it that. He sounded sick. With that support, they can make worker brood which make more complex human hybrids and warrior brood. The question is, where do telepaths and anything more complex come from? I grinned. Jackpot. What did you find, Arsen Lucas asked. I stood from behind the counter, holding up another one of those PDAs, similar to the one I had found back in the weaponized Tesseract labs. I tapped through it and found that it had a recording as well. The recording crackled on, and holographic recreations of two women appeared, standing and sitting at the countertop. One had her rump resting on the countertop, and the other was putting her feet up. The holographic display was fuzzier than the old PDA, making it way harder to tell faces, but their voices were clear enough. Huh, it's recording the girl sitting with her rump on the counter, who I decided to mentally name Rump Down, said. Got anything you want to say for Posteriti? She giggled, feet upside and rolled her head back so that it hung over the edge of her chair. Ugh, I'm so freaking bored. Rump Down shrugged. Be glad we're not getting more work. I hear that there was another freakout down in cryonics. What? Fida put her feet down sitting up and thus ruined her nickname. You're kidding. That's the third this week. Do you know what it was? Corporate keeps that shit hush who rumped down sprang to her feet as a recorded harumph rang out. She turned around and a vague half shape appeared at the edge of the projector, clearly at the outer range of its recording capacities. That figure remained at that distance, but despite being a blurry mass of pixels and random geometric images created by the holographic display, it still managed to somehow seem to be disapproving. Miss Murdoch, Miss Loser, the disapproving figure said, I want you both to get ready. A new high roller is coming through for the SDP project, and I want her to be impressed. The vague shape vanished away. Dickless there doesn't remember that the P in SDP stands for project, does he? Rump down whispered. But then the holographic display faded away. As it vanished, I frowned, then thumbed through some of the non-holographic recordings on the PDA. I found the name for the last person that had come into the station. It was... Shock of shocks. My name. The actual offices beyond the main lobby were all well appointed and rife with ancient paperwork. That actually struck me as somewhat odd. In a space station with nanotechnology and artificial gravity, why the fuck would you use paper? But it became clear the instant I picked one of the papers up. It was written in a strange series of runic letters that ran together quite unintelligibly, not English at all. With that cipher, and the fact that paper was utterly unhackable no matter how good you were at computers, then all the records in all these offices were safe. But there were more pressing things to worry about than my own frustration at not finding any hints about my past, present, or future. For instance, the narrow corridors bore scratches and abrasions that spoke of something large and long writhing through them. The carpet was mulched by claw marks. A few paintings had once hung on the walls, the slightly pale rectangles giving testament to where the artwork had remained. They had been snatched away, leaving behind tattered wallpaper and shattered wood panels. Something big had stolen every fucking thing that shone or glittered or gleamed. I checked my shotgun power supply and summoned a tiny sparkle of lightning along my palm. Both worked. The offices gave way to large meeting rooms. These had been just as pillaged as the lobbies, with paintings and statues, and even gold gilt scraped away. The first of the meeting rooms had held a large mahogany table, and it had been crushed in half by some errant footstep. The ceiling lamp that hung over the room was knocked askew, but still provided enough illumination for me to spy another one of those holographic recording PDAs. I snatched it up, then tensed. My ears heard nothing but the faint rumble of the air recycling systems, grown slightly louder the further that I moved away from the elevators, and the need for a good impression grew less and less important. The PDA tapped on and fuzzy figures appeared, several seated at the now-destroyed table, their arms resting on nothingness. So, Miss Montenegro, a voice, 
Dickless, I recognized him despite the fact he was no longer a growling collection of geometric shapes and fuzzy pixels. There wasn't enough definition on the recording to show his expression, though I did get a faint sense that he was a slender man, not heavily built or fat. That's the basic program. I most still cannot quite believe it. My own voice came from the figure at the other end of the table. Her hands held up some glowing rectangles. The way they wobbled, I realized they were papers. No, not papers, they were slightly too stiff for the papers I had seen scattered around this place. What were they? My old self put the papers down. Immortality, she chuckled. And more, Dickless said, gesturing to the side. Oh, my old self said. Oh yes, I can see why you call it, uh... An unbeatable deal, Dickless said, voice pure sugar. If you sign there, there, and there, we can take you right to the SDP project rooms and we can begin with the work. My old self bent forward and started to sign. They stood and the holographic recording shut off, but not before I saw that they were heading to the left. My heart sprang into my throat and I hurried towards the doorway. Shotgun at the ready, I saw nothing but two curving corridors, one head towards the SDP and the other one headed for the lounge. From the direction of the lounge, I could hear that sound. That low, rumbling, grinding sound. My ears perked up and I felt goosebumps slide along my arms. That's not the air recyclers, isn't it? What, Lassie? Lucas asked. Have either of you gotten the fucking cameras on? And it's Beatrice Lucas, I whispered, aiming my shotgun towards the curving corner leading towards the lounge. That slow, steady, in-and-out rumble continued. The sound of breathing. Now that I was attuned to the idea of it, I realized I could feel a moist heat sliding down the corridor. Something moist and hot clung to my face and cheeks, and I felt my cheeks turn red with the sticky heat. It was like being breathed on by a lover in a jungle all at once. That faintly sweet scent, so close to decay and fruit that it made me simultaneously nauseous and hungry, filled my nostrils. Thick, cloying. I shook my head and backed towards the SDP rooms. Nay, lassie, Lucas said. Jules, I whispered. He didn't respond. I frowned. I hoped that the task hadn't come on where they had been working. He was just taking a piss. That thought was nice. Comforting. Not that I wanted to have him piss on me or anything, but it was just something normal here in this timeless hell surrounded by fucking abominations. I felt my own bladder twinge and my cheeks turned red as I realized I hadn't done anything normal in far too long. At least I had gotten a few snatches of a bite to eat while working on the collar. My thumb touched the button as my collar buzzed, giving me an idea of how long I'd been rummaging around this place. An hour. I nodded, and then came to the SDP room. Ah, there you are, Jules said, his voice coming from a speaker that hung from the corner of the room. My brow furrowed as I looked around the place, my lips turning down slightly. The SDP room was a fusion of the art deco of the rest of the corporate section, with a bit of the antiseptic futurism of the technical research levels of the station. There were six large seats, three on one side of the room, and three on the other. They looked a bit like the kind of seats you might see at a dentist's office, with a headrest and armrests. But attached to their backs were gilt and wood-paneled domes that were mounted on boom arms. I walked over and took hold of one of the domes, flipping it over, and hissed. The inside of the dome, concealed by position, were an array of thick spines and needles that looked as if they were able to pierce through human skin and bone with ease. My thumb accidentally found a small switch on the outer edge of the dome, the needles thrust forward with a loud snick. I jerked away. What the fucking fuck, I snarled. What, what is it, Jules asked, voice alarmed, ringing from the speaker. I looked at it. It's a fucking hairdresser's salon with fucking Iron Maiden helmets. What? That was Tracy's voice. She sounded muffled and far away. And then came closer, a crackling sound filling the speaker, like her thumb was rubbing the microphone. Her voice was focused and hard. B. There should be a switch on the edge of the helmet, is there? Yeah, I said, frowning. And it makes the needles stab inwards. 
Fuck, fuck, Tracy hissed. What, what is it, I asked. They're Ryan DeWitt quantum induction machines on, she said. And the fuck are those? I hissed, trying to keep my voice from raising into a screech. They, Tracy paused. They scan memories, personalities, souls, I guess, so they can be uploaded onto computers. She was silent for a moment longer, or clones. The low, steady sound of distant breathing was eclipsed in the background of my hearing by a roaring in my ears, like the sea, crashing on the surface. I shook my head, slowly. My back thumped into the side of the wall and my knees gave way. I sank down, breathing slowly in and out, in and out, in and out. Focus, Beatrice. Focus. Drag in one breath. Let it go. Drag in. Let go. My eyes started to close. I slammed my head into the wall, slammed it again and again and again, feeling pain surge through me. But pain was better than the alternative. A cry I didn't know I could make escaped from between clenched teeth as I shuddered, convulsively. I wanted to be sick, but I didn't have enough in me to let it out. It was a poison, that thought, that horrible realization. I wasn't Beatrice Montenegro, I was... I could see without the need of holographic display a hazy half-imagined ghost that sat down on the chair, except I was seeing it from the perspective of that ghost while also viewing it from the outside, like an alien observer. Bifocal realities. I saw the smiling face of the corporate ghoul looking down at me and a doctor. The doctor was checking a PDA, tapping off readouts that she was looking at. The ghoul, Dickless, looked at me. Don't worry, his echo said. You won't feel a thing. And then you don't need to think about it back on the yacht. Will I, will it remember this? Oh no, Dickless said. There will only be dreams. The images fuzzed away and I clenched my jaw. Jules, I whispered raggedly. What does SDP stand for? I don't know, he said, his voice tight. I shoved myself to my feet. Fip, fuck this. Fuck this fucking station. Fuck that fucking bitch. I snarled, staggering past the seats, leaving my shotgun behind at the doorway. Discarded. I started to root through the room, searching for the computer I needed. I'm getting the computer, then I'm heading right fucking back. There'd need to be a good computer here, right? I asked. Well, the scanners are... Yes or fucking no, Tracy? I shouted, not caring about stealth at the moment. Tracy's subdued voice came from the speaker. Yes. Lassie, Lucas started whispering quietly in my ear. I hung my head forward, my forehead pressing to the metal surface of the wall above the computer alcove. There was a computer component inside but I didn't know if it was powerful enough. Lucas started again. Beatrice. Yeah? I asked. You actually could kick Beatrice's ass, he said. The fake on. And why do you think she's fake, I asked. I like you more, Lucas said. Wouldn't it feel good to just headbutt her unconscious? I breathed in. I remembered earlier what felt like weeks earlier that I had said that the station might have gone to hell, but I sure wasn't. For a moment, I imagined doing a fuck of a lot more than just headbutting the woman, who had gotten me into this mess, who had created me for immortal it's in Magical powers. I imagined her mouth, bleeding and toothless, for said to felity my shotgun. I imagined pulling the trigger, and rather than recoiling from the mental image, I felt my clit harden and my sex moisten. I grabbed onto the sides of the cabinet, then slammed my head into the wall again. The impact sent a flash of white pain through my eyes and I reeled backwards. I sprawled on the floor, gasping, and felt the pain subside only in a slow, sullen way. Lassie? Lucas asked. Don't, uh, encourage my, my darker impulses, Lucas. I snarled, pushing myself to my feet. I'm going to stay myself. I don't know what that is, but I'm going to stay it. I shook my head, then called out. Jules, fuck. I winced, my head ringing. Jules is a G6543342 cybernetic intelligence unit good enough for the portal? Two of them would be, Jules said. I closed my eyes. It was great. I stepped slowly towards the lounge. The breathing became louder and louder. I knew that going slowly would only make the waiting harder and more painful for me. But I couldn't stop myself. I didn't want to see her in... I didn't want to know what new horror this fucking station had to show me. 
but the claw marks were more regular here, and I saw that the doorway, the double doorway, into the lounge had been torn off its hinges. The walls had been compressed and hammered outwards, creating a mouth of a cave, not an entrance to a corporate hack's idea of a rest and relaxation room for the mega wealthy. Steam hissed out of it, and the stink of heat and jungle moistness and sweetness was almost overpowering. Sweat dripped down my face and I forced myself to lean my head around the corner and saw the lounge had been demolished. Comfortable couches splintered, pool tables upended, their balls sent scattered. But rather than being cleared away, the center of the room, a large pit of an area with a raised walkway surrounding it, had become heaped with treasure. Golden statues had been crumbled into chunks while paintings had been set here and there. Some of the statues had been so completely turned to rubble that they simply looked like gold-painted rocks and marble. Others remained, an Art Deco head looking out into the air, a single arm reaching out from the rubble, reaching for some kind of release. For a moment, I could only see the rubble. Then I saw the tail twitch, and the nostrils flare. My eyes widened more and more and more as I saw the tusk that sprawled atop its heaped treasures. It was a long-limbed, bony creature, but the bones were the size of small cars. They were light gray, with black highlights, and the spine was decorated by thick protrusions somewhere between curved spurs and slick, grasping fingers. The ribcage was convex, expanding outwards, before rapidly narrowing towards a tight belly, giving the creature the proportions of a greyhound dog in a concentration camp. Leathery wings, spread between fingers of white bone, sprang from the shoulders, and the long neck terminated in a bullet-shaped head with an eyeless smoothness that bespoke the brood. Hissing steam came from that creature's mandibles, and looking down its open maw, I could see glistening shapes that seemed more like organs than a proper throat. It was a fucking dragon, and nestled there between its two massive foreclaws and within a stone's throw of its head was another G65 computer unit. I slung my shotgun into my backpack. It wouldn't be much help now, would it? My legs refused to move, my arms could grasp and reach, but my arms locked in place and refused to shift. My knees had taken over from my thinking brain, and an ancient instinct, an instinct older than humans walking on their own two feet. That instinct said, no, 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 no. I closed my eyes, clenched my jaw, and forced my foot to move. I stepped forward once, then again, and felt the fear ebbing in my body. It was strange, though. You might have thought that learning I was a clone, a copy printed out and filled with half-memories and personality fragments would mean I should feel less fear. I had less to lose, huh? Except that I didn't, and I was realizing that now, as I crept towards the dragon. I had the prickle of my skin and the rasp of air in my lungs. I had the sweetness in my nostrils, the hammer of my heart between my ribs. I had the pulse rushing through my veins, throbbing behind my ears. I had the slick, sweet feeling of jewels entering me, and the cold hatred for the task, and I had all of that and more buzzing in my head. Say what you will about being trapped on a nightmare station filled with hideous dimensional abominations, it did help you appreciate your life. And as I got closer and closer to those talons, I knew. I didn't want to die, I didn't want to lose this, my knees threatened to lock up, but I saw the computer unit. It was almost in my grasp. I stepped onto another bit of carpet and felt the weight of my body settle. The computer unit was right there. The hot breath of the dragon hissed across my body, streaming from its bony, chitinous nostrils. The sweetness was almost overpowering. It smelled like cherries here. My mouth watered despite my situation. Another reason to live. I reached out, then closed my slick fingers on the computer unit. It creaked as I picked it up, and the breathing from the dragon paused. I froze, then the dragon breathed out again. I turned and fought back the urge to run and run and run. I stepped away and the breathing stopped again. A low hissing rattle of detritus being stirred by an immense tail sent a cracking lightning bolt along my spine. I took another step, and then heard those immense arms creaking, and the head shifting, and the snoring turned into a loud hiss that washed me over with moistness. I am not ashamed to admit that I pissed myself. The urine was wicked away by my nanotech suit, my body clean as a whistle as I turned, stupefied with fear. I should have sprinted away, 
I should have ran. But my knees were locked again and I watched as the dragon loomed over me. Balls, I whispered. The ribcage of the dragon crunched. Chitin slid backwards and a biomechanical seam was revealed between those plates. They locked, and then the seam hissed open, revealing a mass of hanging fibers and wires and cables. Some were red, but most were black. They connected to a hanging, cruciform figure. It was shrouded in darkness and mist, and I heard a series of whip-sharp pops and cracks as the wires detached, hanging free. The figure dropped down into the carpet before me and suddenly I was soaked with something. Definitely not piss. The figure was a tusk. Their head was sleek and swept back, with a series of long dreadlocks made of biomechanical cables that tumbled down the back of their jet-black, rubbery skin. Exoskeletal ribs were stretched over a sleek, muscular torso, like armor and clothing at once, but they revealed and cupped those hard muscles, accentuating the exotic beauty of his body. He had muscle groups no human would have, not the familiar six-pack and pecs of, say, jewels, but the very strangeness of his muscles made me unable to not notice how slick and sleek they were. His hips came to two narrow points, and his arms were slightly longer than a human's would be. His fingers came to fine points. His face had an almost draconic cast to it, though the eyeless forehead was partially covered by the bangs of his biomechanical hair, concealing and accentuating his lack of human features. His muzzle was twisted in a slightly sardonic smirk, and a pair of sleek feathered wings were clasped behind his back. And between his legs was a member that put Jules to utter shame. It was sleek and ridged, with a flat, almost horse-like tip. It was rubbery and black and glistened, as his whole body did, as if he had been rubbed down with oil. His legs came to a pair of fine, arched lizard-like feet, and a whipping tail twititched from side to side behind him. L S R un. Luca's voice came through a haze. I stepped slowly forward. The humanoid unit from the dragon reached out. Claws caressed my cheek gently. A sting, as intense and fierce as pleasure, came from the contact points. He slid those claws to my lips, and I tasted blood. My eyes half closed as I put my tongue to the tip of one of his claws and he turned it just so. I felt the sharpness, but didn't feel it bite. But it could. My nipples ached. My head spun. Softly, he whispered. In English. Not a hybrid. Not a human tusk amalgamation. But a pure breed tusk. Unlike anything else I had ever seen. But his words were still soft and sibilant and oh so fucking... You're quite tired, aren't you, Beatrice? I breathed in his scent. His sweet, sweet scent. Lay with me, he said, gesturing to his horde. The computer component thumped to the ground, utterly forgotten. I stepped forward, my body burning with need. W what are you? I asked, feeling dazed. A very tiny voice screaming in the back of my mind was trying to get my attention. But his beauty was too much. His exotic, hideous beauty. His clawed hand caressed my back and drew me closer to him. My hip and his touched and then his sharpness pressed to the nanites, parting them. When he pushed me forward, a gentle, playful push that sent me tumbling into the gold and paintings with a laugh. Somehow it was softer than a cloud, and I rolled around watching him as he stepped over to stand above me. Leviathan, he whispered. And then he knelt down and kissed me. His lips were hard and yet rubbery. His tongue was long, but it didn't invade like the other Tesk. It came, and it caressed, and it tickled, and teased, and explored. My eyes closed, and I shuddered against him, my hands sliding along his sides. They found his hips, gripping the bony extrusions. My heart raced faster and faster, and when Leviathan pulled back, his tongue remained for a few delicious seconds more, before slipping free. I gasped loudly, my eyes hooded. Oh God, I breathed. He's not here, Leviathan husked. Then his clawed hands slashed out and my clothing fell to the ground, in utter tatters. His clawed fingertips caressed the bottom of my breast, not drawing blood, just making me intensely aware of the fact that he could. My nipple puckered even harder and I looked down at my bared flesh. He regarded my tits with the slow wonder of someone who had never quite appreciated them. Hmm, or maybe he is. A claw tip pressed to my nipple and managed to tease it without cutting. 
I bit my lip hard enough to turn it sheet white and tried to resist moaning. Leviathan chuckled. Don't bother, he hissed. I let my lip slip from under my lip and groaned, my hands going to the collar. That was already trying to restore the torn and ripped nanites. I unclipped it, tossed it, and tossed the attachment that would shock me. I didn't want to stop this moment. I leaned forward and caught Leviathan's lips again. His teeth were bared and sharp, and I loved the tingle of them against my tongue. His hands grabbed my hips, and he loomed over me, wings spreading outwards to cover us, trapping us in his heat, his moistness. I felt the thick arm length of his cock against me. I moaned in desperation and broke the kiss. Leviathan, I whispered. The voice, screaming at me, managed to get a question out. Why, I... You... Shh, he whispered. It will all become clear. I'm merely making a choice. Multifaceted. That cock ground against me as he rolled his hips back. I should have needed lubrication. I should have needed stretching. I should have needed to be twice as big and a fucking horse. But I didn't care. I wanted that cock to split me in half. So badly that I was willing to beg. The words bubbled out of my mouth as I reached up to cup his sleek black face. Fuck me, Leviathan. Take me. Make me yours. Pound me. Oh God, I want to be ruined. I whispered, desperately. Every time I breathed in to speak, I scented more of that humid musk. Yes. Musk. There was more than sweetness to the scent now. There was musk, rich and male. So very male. I spread my thighs wide and felt his bony hands close around my ankles. He spread me further, bent me past what I thought possible. But my body was more flexible and plaint than I had imagined. My cunt spread for him and that flat-tipped, ridged dick pressed to my entrance. Leviathan paused. Despite lacking eyes, I felt that he was looking into mine, deeply into mine. We are running out of time, he whispered. There is a balance in all things, Beatrice. His cock plunged into me. His voice had been cool and calm for that statement. Almost logical, even if the logic escaped me. But every moment of that intensely long thrust, that pinning moment that turned me from quivering needy woman to fucking cock slave, Leviathan was as passionate as any man I could want. His whole body quivered, his alien musculature tightening and flexing under my gaze. His moisture, the slickness that coated his body, dripped onto my face and tasted of machine oil and male sweat. I licked it up desperately, wanting him to fill me in every way as his firm black ball slapped my ass like a metal paddle. Mmm, Leviathan groaned. Shockingly, intensely human. Then, quietly, he laughed, and I felt his tail peeking against my anus. It was slick and sleek, and as it caressed me, I heard him whisper. A virgin, he murmured, and a cheating whore a curious complexity, savory, like sweet wine. Before I could ask, before I could beg for him to do exactly what he was thinking of doing, that tail spread my anus and thrust into me. I felt it coiling through my insides, and somehow there was no pain. There was only an exotic pleasure, the pleasure of knowing that there were two points of connection. The thick, thick cock filling me to the brim and the tail, slipping further and further into me. My eyes shuddered shut, and I felt a shattering climax rush through me. Then another, and another, and another. My back arched, and an incoherent gurgle came from my mouth. I was drooling. I knew it. Then Leviathan thrust, my whole body rocked and my head lolled backwards, my eyes rolling upwards. I couldn't see him, couldn't do anything but feel that pleasure. My mouth opened, whimpering, as his tongue caressed my lips, then plunged home. I was utterly airtight, claimed by a single being bigger than the cosmos and older than time. My body writhed in ecstatic sensations that went beyond pleasure and into realms I could hardly describe if pressed. I clung to what memories I had. Thrust. Fireworks of golden light exploding through my mind. Hands cupped my breasts, playing with me as the humanoid avatar of Leviathan slowly, casually thrust into me. He wasn't even trying, and my brain was being reduced to a puddle of gurgling bliss. I felt more drool dribble along my cheeks, stinging against the cuts on my skin as my head writhed from side to side. The tentacle in my throat was pressing deep enough to cut off air. My nose flared and breathed only against blockage, 
The panic and excitement of being strangled set off more fireworks. Deep, red hues. Thrust out, I clung desperately on memories of Lucas Jules the escape at thrust. My body jiggled and I felt my brain oozing out of my ears. The tentacle slipped from my mouth and I gasped desperately for air and immediately started mewling. I couldn't help it. Shh, Leviathan whispered. It's almost done. Thrust. My back felt like if it bent more I'd snap my spine, my bones would shatter with the pleasure and I would lay there, bleeding out, my body twitching, my soul escaping my lips with a song, a song of joy. I never needed heaven, I had been there and hell and everywhere in between. Slowly, I realized that the pleasure was coming not in thrusts, but in waves now, and I could hear, barely, over the sound of my own heart, the fierce pop 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 of those rubbery balls slapping my ass, that tail slipping out of my anus leaving it gaping and wanting more. Leviathan groaned deep in his throat. Again, such a human noise, heat bloomed, and I finally blissfully blacked out, my shattered mind reaching desperately for unconsciousness, a way to spare itself. But the pleasure that chased it down was nearly enough to sear out every nerve in my body, and I fell not into sleep, but into a twitching, thoughtless nothingness. I fell into bliss and I tumbled into heaven, I woke by bits and pieces. First my foot ached, then my left leg was numb. The tingling pressure of blocked blood flow more than I had expected. Then my fingertips felt the soft, scratchy rasp of the maroon carpet. My cheek pressed against something slick and damp. My eyes were unfocused, drinking in light. I managed, slowly, to blink. The light focused by a single tick. I blinked again. The focusing was more intense. Now I could actually see faint blurry shapes that loomed around me. I blinked a third time and now... Now I saw that I was sprawled on an alleyway. No, not an alleyway, a corridor. A corridor I knew. I had been dumped out near the fucking lobby. I managed to get my arms under my body and shove myself up slightly. My knees wobbled despite being tucked against the ground and I felt my head spin. I touched my cheek. Despite expecting my finger to come away coated with gray slime, and bits of my fucked scrambled brains dribbling out of my ear. I only saw drool. As I, I blinked slowly and tried to make words. The sound that came out of my mouth was, my yaff, lace assy. <laughs> the voice was Lucas and he was coming clearer and clearer. I closed my eyes, shook my head, and managed to say, Lucas. My voice came out as if someone had fucked it with sandpaper. What, where? You've been out of contact for three hours, Lassie, Lucas said. What happened? I looked down, my belly was slightly distended. White cum dripped from my thighs, sloshing onto the ground. It felt shamefully good, like I was pissing cum. It dribbled down and splatted onto the ground. I tried to keep a huge, goofy grin off my face as I looked down at the floor before me. Because sitting right there were two computer components. The components that I needed. They looked new and cleaned, as if they had been wiped down and left gleaming. More cum dripped along my thighs. I found the components, I said, sounding slightly drunk. And I need a fucking shower. Somehow I managed to stagger out to the lobby and to the elevator entrance. There, I saw the flayed corpses. I frowned, looking at them, my head spinning. But pieces were tumbling around in my head, and something clicked as I looked at those bodies. The blood had dripped onto the gouged out areas of the wall. The flayed bodies had been put up after... After they had been looted. I frowned. The bodies faced away. They faced the rest of corporate. It's a prison, I whispered, my hand dipped down, pressing to my belly. To my womb. What's getting out, I breathed. I stepped away from the elevator as the doors started to close. The computer components were heading up to the portal, and I was down here in the guts of Virgil Station. It wasn't engineering. Engineering was where people turned theory into practicality. This was the area that was labeled on the map as cryonics. It was where I had started. It was back to the beginning. My head still buzzed with the revelations that I had seen on the way to cryonics. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to feel. I just knew what I had to do. I had to get the power rerouted back to the portal. With that and the computer and the Tesk genetic signature that they had up there, Jules and the other survivors could get home, to Earth, to a planet I had never seen but in dreams and memories stolen from another woman. Lassie, 
Lucas's voice, as smooth as ever, broke into my thoughts. What happened up there? In corporate? Leviathan, my skin covered in goosebumps and my nipples hardened enough to cut glass. I shivered and felt the ache of my sex spreading for that massive cock. The warmth of his alien cum spurting into me. And I heard his voice rumbling and rich like dark chocolate. I am making a choice multifaceted. All things balance in the end, Beatrice. Lassie? Lucas sounded more insistent. What happened? A big scary fuck off space dragon tried to kill me and I ran away real fast, I snapped. Lucas, where are you on this fucking station again? I've been hiding in a closet, he said. You can collect me on the way back. You just need to get the power rerouted. The components are located at several junctions you've been at before when you were first exploring this place. I'll sing out when you get to him, but look for something labeled as BDBS2. That'll be the first bit of fuckery you'll need to get working. I nodded and started forward, my feet thumping on the ground. I was too tired and worn to want to bother with stealth. And honestly, I felt like I could use a chance to fucking rip and tear some monsters apart. I came to the first echo of what I had seen before. The woman, her throat still bulging with cum, her eyes still wide as she looked out at nothing. She hadn't started to decay, which made sense. It had only been... What? A few hours? And I didn't even know if she would. Time didn't exist in the Tesk universe, save for what we dragged with us. I knelt down next to her, frowning at her face and... Wait, you look familiar, I muttered. It had been blurred and covered in static, but I pulled out the PDA that I had grabbed from corporate, skimming through the files on it. I found a selfie and checked it. Yeah, I was right. This girl was feet up from the desk in corporate, Rachel Loser. She was in the Human Resources Department, according to the bits of her PDA I could access. What the fuck was a Human Resources flunky from? My head pulsed and a faint memory hazed across my vision. It felt as if I could half see the corridor I was in and half see a different one. The two superimposed across my eyes and my head ached harder. Migraine fierce. I fell back onto my butt groaning as I realized the reason why the two visions jarred so much was because it was the same corridor, just viewed from different angles. I tilted my head back, trying to get the visions to match, and realized the memory was of me. On a gurney, bouncing, jouncing, it felt edged with ice and hard. Not the faint phantasmagoria of the memories of the boat, the girl, the kiss. This was my memory, not Beatrice's memory. We have a class nine on the line, a male voice said, echoing. Oh, Miss Montenegro is going to be pleased. Okay, prep the CSC and get Dobbs on it. That was Loser's voice in my mind. Dobbs did the freak out yesterday. He's on Psyche. Furo, uh, you co- the memory shattered as Lucas spoke up. Lassie? My name is... I snapped, springing to my feet. Furious that he had snapped me out of it, I shook my head. Never mind. What? Just wanted to make sure you weren't spacing out on me. Lucas said quietly. Listen, you need to work fast. This station may be running out of time. I've stopped getting recordings from the habitation deck. I rubbed my palm along my face, but something was bugging me. Something that didn't quite resolve by the time I had reached the first component. Lucas walked me through, yanking it open, fiddling with the bits inside, flipping the switches. Once I had finished up and slapped the casing closed, he said, All right, that should handle it. You won't need to worry about the next one as much. It's just the exact same procedure. Got it, I said, rubbing at my eye with my thumb to clear out some grit. Three more components to fiddle into place and the power was rerouted to the portal. We got out. Or did we? Did Jules and Tracy and... Did I get out? I rubbed on my chin. Jules? I asked. You read me? Nothing. I looked around myself and saw there were no speakers. I searched my memory of the last time I had rooted around here and started back to the locker room where I had gotten the pistol. Stepping inside, I found the two drones I had smashed were still there. I was actually getting better at recognizing the components and spotted a few that were basically the same comm units that other people on this station had used. It was cheaper to use the same component and slap it into a drone than it was to specially make one for the specific drone. 
It was holding that component in my palm, like an ugly egg of plastic and black metal, that it clicked into place. I frowned and stood up. Lucas? I asked. What, lass? He asked. Nothing, just wanted to make sure you were still with me, I said. He grunted. I walked to the second component and then started to yank it apart. When I was halfway through, I asked again, Lucas? No answer. I frowned, my face set, and continued to work on the bits and pieces within with one hand. My free hand held up the communicator, and I clicked through frequencies with my thumb. It clicked to one, and I heard Jules's voice sound squeaky and corrupted and hard to hear. Are you another survivor? He asked. I just got the signal from... It's me, Jules, I said, my voice quick. I don't have much time. Can you detect tesk, energy, or something? We have that capacity, yes, he said, but it has to be timed right. The burst of exotic particles lasts a very short time, and... When I turn this communicator on again, you have to be really quiet and not speak to me through it, I whispered, and scan the whole fucking station. Got it? Do you got it? Yes, I understand, Jules said, sounding mystified. I turned off the communicator, then plugged in another component. As it clicked into place, the device whirred to life and the power continued to redirect. I started to walk down the corridor, then grinned slightly, trying to hide any nerves I felt. I could just be imagining things. I could just be building paranoid delusions, the first such delusion from someone who had been cockshocked into madness by a fucking Tesk monster. For all I knew, everything after Leviathan was just a fevered daydream. Fuck. Everything before Leviathan might have been a fucking dream. Lucas? I asked, cramming all those worries away. Yeah, Lassitzi, he asked, sounding distracted. Just wondering, I said, turning on the communicator as subtly as I could, hiding it against my hip. You got a girlfriend? What does that have to do with anything, Lassie? He sounded amused. Well, I mean, I'm kind of feeling on edge here. This whole fucking day has been one insane piece of bullshit after another, I said, shaking my head. Having some human contact will be real nice, I'm just saying. Lucas sighed softly. Fine, lassie, okay, I don't have a girlfriend, but I did have a lot of friends who were girls and were quite pleased to have me around, if you know what I mean. FWB? I asked, grinning. The letters coming from the depths of my memory without need for elaboration. You know it, lassie, he said, then sighed. Listen, I've got to get back to work on some hacking I'm doing. I nodded and prayed. When his voice went away, I paused, then held the communicator up and whispered into it as I stood beside the final power conduit. Did you get it? Jules' voice was silent for a long time. I worried he didn't have a connection to me for a moment, but then he spoke. His voice rasped and sounded like he had run several miles by himself. I did, he paused. It's coming from the center of cryonics. That room is just a collection of pipes and cryogenic storage systems. It's not a room. Nothing should come from there. I slowly turned to the side and looked at the corridor made by the cryocoffins. There they were, creating a pair of parallel lines that lead straight to a solidly built bulkhead. I remembered what felt like a month ago standing at this very place looking down this very corridor, at that very bulkhead. I remember being filled with the terror of the doors opening by themselves, of the corpses moving when I wasn't looking at them. I clenched my fist and started forward. My feet padded almost silently on the ground as I walked past coffins. I walked past coffin 0451. I came to the doorway and tried the hatch. It refused to budge. Of course, I snarled, pulling my fingers away from the hatch. I noticed a set of scanners, subtly hidden along the hatch. Biometric scanners. Who put biometric scanners on a hatch, leading into a room full of pipes and maintenance systems? I felt coldly furious as I turned back and walked off. When I returned, blood splattered my face and arm, and I was holding a ragged stump and a grasping hand. Shotguns were not exceptionally good at amputating things, but when you had infinite ammo, you can do a lot of shit. I slapped the hand onto the hatch, then sent a tiny jolt of electrical energy through it, just enough to cause it to grip and warm. The hatch chimed, and I was able to twist it open with a vicious jerk. It swung inwards and I stepped into the center of cryonics, and back in time. I stood in a room I remembered vividly and yet had never been in. 
But it wasn't just that sense of horrible deja vu that made me feel as if I had stepped backwards through time. Rather, it was the fact that the center of the chamber was a six-foot-long stone slab. The edges were cut with gutters and grooves that were clearly designed to drain off into a pair of receptacles. Both of those receptacles were empty at the moment, but I could see where the bottle would snap in. The table was covered with curling, curving runes. Runes, the same as the inside of the collar that controlled my nanite clothing. The walls were decorated by unfurled red banners and six-sided pentagrams. A leering goat's head statue sat in the center of the wall looming over the macabre altar. Chains were connected to that altar. Chains that were spattered with drying blood. I remembered being pushed towards the altar, robed figures loomed over me, and I remembered being chained down, and I remembered a voice. Begin the ritual. The chanting. It rose goosebumps along my skin, even in memory. And then, then, oh, then, the jarring, the hideous juxtaposition, the cell phone going off. I could remember one of the robed figures slapping at themselves, then pulling out their phone. Its light, garish and blue, had splayed across the ceiling, and I could see the smiling face of Rachel Loser as she tapped away at the phone, looking up at the others. Sorry, guys, sorry. The memory cut off, as suddenly as if it had been recorded and someone had hit pause. I staggered to one knee, my hand going to my forehead. Ah, I whispered, hotly. My eyes closed, and I felt the migraine pulse shuddering through my head. What the fuck, what the fuck, what the fucking fuck? I snarled. Well, that seems to have torn it down. The voice, so cool and calm and Scottish, came from behind me. I sprang to my feet, backing around, my butt pressing to the altar as I aimed my shotgun at the man who had appeared behind me. He looked as if he wasn't quite there, not because of a holographic shimmer or a crackle. Rather, it was that he was simply too perfect to be in the same world as the rest of us. His hair was raven black, and his eyes were piercing, emerald green. He wore a finely pressed suit, sharp and clean lined with a golden pocket watch in one hand. He was looking down at it and snapped it shut as I leveled my shotgun at his face. He looked up at me tossing his head to flip some bangs back. His angular beauty made my heart ache. It reminded me of Leviathan. I suppose the charade couldn't have lasted forever, Lassie, Lucas said. I stepped to the side not wanting to touch the altar anymore. My shotgun didn't waver. Who the fuck are you, I snarled. Lucas chuckled. I have a lot of names, Lassie, more than you do. He smirked slightly as he stepped forward, his feet not making a noise as he walked forward. The Dawnstar, the Accuser, the Roaring Lion. He spread his arms wide. I am the Lightbringer, I am the whole fucking universe. He smirked at me and the Scottish accent faded, dropped like a mask. He was close enough to touch me now my shotgun almost bumping against his nose. His finger reached up and he gently pushed it aside, and you are going to help me to set this record straight. The Tesk aren't aliens, are they? I asked. Depends on your definition, the Lightbringer said, walking slowly past me. He started to circle around me, his finger caressing the edge of the altar. Better, it depends on your perspective. There are a great number of worlds. Some are light, some are dark, some rich with potential, some dying and cracked. He grinned at me as he came back around the altar. Somehow he had moved so that I was pinned. His arms were on either corner of the altar. My butt pressed against the edge of it. I could touch his two perfect arms or I could try and scramble up on the altar. But I didn't move. I couldn't look away from his eyes. I couldn't stop listening to his voice. Where a world is perched between extremes it creates potential energy. Like the magnet in an electrical generator. The Lightbringer said, his breath hot against my face. Your world is one such, caught betwixt and between, and so your souls have been marvelously potent. I gulped slowly, and Templesoft has been, what, dealing with demons? The Lightbringer laughed. Oh no, Lassie, the UC started that. He stepped back and away from me, his hands sliding behind his back. But Templesoft pick it up where they left off and they figured out this little program. He gestured around himself with one hand, clone someone who wants to sell their soul, imprint their memories onto the clone, and sacrifice the clone. And that works? I asked. The Lightbringer's shoulders twitched. 
He didn't look back at me, but I could tell he was upset. I smirked slowly as he breathed in, then out. It's harder to tell when you're not there. You get the burst of energy, the soul. After a time, the soul dissolves, far faster than it should. That tipped off my lieutenants and eventually, myself. And ever since then, Temple Soft fucking bilked. The Lightbringer's hand closed around my throat. He lifted me up and off my feet, effortlessly. The iron vice of his grip squeezed tight, and his cold eyes flashed as he looked into mine. He snarled, softly, then spoke and shook me with every word for emphasis. Don't. Poke. The. Bear. Lassie. He dropped me, and I hit the ground hard. I gasped for air, my eyes hooded. The Lightbringer shook his head slowly. Our finances are in arrears, but fortunately souls delivered directly should last a great deal longer than those delivered via death. I rubbed my throat, coughing. What the fuck are you on about? <laughs> You're going to reroute the portal to my home, the Lightbringer said calmly. My eyes widened. And then you go home he said calmly. You get to take up the life of one Beatrice Montenegro. She offered her soul, and your ritual might have been interrupted by this station being yanked into hell. The conduit is open. I breathed slowly. So, you want me to dump those four into hell? Then murder a woman who... Dump four people who worked for a corporation like this one without asking a single question into a richly deserved afterlife, then complete a contract made by a woman who wants her brother's wealth and is too cowardly to take it, the Lightbringer said, turning to look down at me. Admit it, nothing you've seen here makes them worth saving. Clones, sacrificed to appease the rich. Weapons technology, in a world already with a piece fragile enough to break with a cough. He shook his head slowly. I rubbed my throat, feeling the pain fading to almost nothing. But I kept up the movement, not wanting to give away my thoughts. I looked at the Lightbringer, past the Lightbringer, at the statue leering down at me from the wall, that statue of the horned goat, the leering eyes, those slitted pupils. I slowly licked my lips. And I get wealth, fame, immortality? The Lightbringer chuckled. As close to immortality as can be offered one with your shiny mantic makeup, yes. I grinned. Sounds good. The Lightbringer smirked. If I was a dickless asshole, I murmured. I pulled the trigger. The shotgun wasn't aimed expertly. But it didn't need to be aimed expertly. It was a fucking shotgun. The pellet slammed into the leering statue, shattering it into a spray of plaster and chunks of stone. The cloud of the impact filled the room and the Lightbringer staggered away from me, screeching. I scrambled to my feet, sprinting towards the exit. Then I heard the screeching changing pitch. Hue. Tone. It was becoming something else. Laughter. You idiot. The Lightbringer laughed, emerging from the chamber. He looked more real than he ever had before. Dust caking his suit, mussing up his hair. He brushed it off his shoulders and smirked at me. That wasn't an icon of my power. That was my prison. I gulped. Crap. The Lightbringer snapped his fingers. The cryocrypts opened, and the desiccated corpses of the other sacrifices emerged. Their bodies showed, now that they were standing upright, the huge cuts where their hearts had been removed, their entrails ripped out. They stepped out, their arms reaching towards me, hideous moans busting from their mouths. I stepped back against the wall and felt a clammy hand close around my ankle. I looked down and saw the one-handed corpse of Rachel Lawsoner looking up at me, her mouth gurgling, her eyes glowing with red fury. I shot her in the head and staggered backwards and away. The other zombies were rushing forward, and I could hear snarling sounds coming from the other cryo corridors. I'd be surrounded soon. I stepped backwards, waiting until the zombies were clustered. Then I fired out a blast of lightning at the ceiling conduit that I had prepped. It exploded in a spray of sparks and arcing lightning. Zombies exploded in sprays of gore and I staggered backwards with the impact of bone and blood along my forearm. The conduit's surging power faded for a moment. I risked a sprint forward, rushing for the elevator shaft. 
I got there almost at the same time as the second zombie horde. My shotgun roared and several zombies staggered backwards, more thrown by the pellet impacts than damaged. But as I cocked the shotgun, I heard laughter chasing me from behind the corridor. The Lightbringer walked towards me, shaking his head slightly as he went. I hauled myself into the elevator and slammed down the button for corporate. The elevator closed, and I held up the communicator I had salvaged from the drone. The roar of gunfire that reached my ears was intense and made Jules hard to hear. We're only getting a third of the power needed, he said, and the Tesk are boiling out of every fucking hole in the wall. The turrets are going full tilt, and we're... There was a roar of gunfire, getting louder, then softer. And we're not going to hold out forever. Warm up the portal, I said, and you're not here. It'll take extra time thanks to the lower power, right? I asked. Just fucking do it. The doors opened and I came into corporate. I could hear rattling in the pipes. But I didn't give it any mind. I ran forward towards the flayed bodies that had been put up on the walls. Prison, huh? I leaped up, grabbing one of the spikes. I hauled back and managed to wrench it free with a grunt, and the corpse swung away from the wall, hideously red. It tore free from the other nails as I dropped down. It splatted, and the pipes burst open as hundreds of broodlings emerged from the darkness. They scuttled into the room with Will Dabendone. I had to work faster. I swung my shotgun around, not aiming at the broodlings. I aimed at the second flayed corpse, and I fired and took it in the shoulder. Flesh snapped and popped and tore, and the body thumped to the ground leaving only two solitary arms stuck to the wall. I managed to work another shotgun pump and blow another corpse, this one slumping in half, before the broodlings were on me. They swarmed over my body, and I felt teeth slamming into the nanite sheath surrounding my body. I screamed and thrashed, firing off lightning, but it did nothing to the massive swarm. Their teeth continued to bite and bite, and though they didn't tear my flesh, they left dozens of stinging bruises. I felt some scuttling against my face and struggled desperately. The sound of the roar that chased them off was like the end of the world. The broodlings tumbled away from my body, screeching. Several burst like hideous fruit, splattering me with their black blood. Then I was sitting up blinking. The immense head of Leviathan looked down at me. His breath was warm on my body. Unexpected, his voice rumbled in my mind. I grinned. The enemy of my enemy, Economos. He fucks my brains out, us apparently. Not this time, that great warm mouth breathed on me again and I was reminded of that time. Laying underneath his avatar, my body stretched deliciously. My eyes shuddered shut and I writhed and panted, and realized I had come. From just the memory and his breath alone, then he was stomping away, heading towards the elevator. It screeched as his arm tore out the innards, the cable snapping, the car tumbling down the shaft. Careless of the damage he was causing, the immense bulk of him slithered into the shaft and was gone. I panted. Inconsiderate asshole, I snarled. I grabbed my spacesuit helmet, snapped it on, stood up. The huge windows and corporate shattered quite nicely. I tumbled outwards into space, buffeted by the air rushing past me. Station-keeping jets flared and sputtered above and below my field of vision. But as I watched, I saw their flames were strangely thin and long. And as the exhaust spiraled away from the station, I saw it twisting and turning inconsistently, as if the very physics that they obeyed were breaking down. It clicked. What would smoke look like if half of the smoke stopped moving because it had run out of time? It'd create strange, skittering geometric clouds just like that. The station was starting to slew slowly. I looked away from it and at the hellish planet that it orbited. No not hellish. Hell. I kicked on the thrusters that I had used to repair the station-keeping engine, shooting towards the physics lab ring of Virgil Station. My heart hammered as I heard the gunfire over my communicator, ringing in my ears, Jules' voice shouting, Look out! I hit the accelerator harder. The airlock started to fill my vision. I spun around and decelerated equally as hard, but I had left it for too long, I slammed into the station hard enough to jar the air out of my lungs. I woofed against the helmet and almost cracked the faceplate against the metal of Virgil Station. Only reflex kept me from spinning away and away and away from the station, my hand closing around the grasping bar above the airlock. 
I tapped at the door and the airlock cycled open. I started forward. Run. The instinct was sudden and intense and set me thrusting forward as hard as I could. Even so, my foot was nearly smashed by the airlock door slamming shut while I was in the middle of it. I gasped loudly, looking around myself. Then it hit me. The Lightbringer had given me my access codes. I had freed him, and now he wasn't interested in me fucking up his plans. But then the gravity of the station was on, and the inner door opened. Air surrounded me now, and through that air I could hear the screech of the brood. The demons and the hammering of the auto turrets was a ferocious undercurrent to the sound of screeching demons. I leaped through the door as fast as I could, rolling and coming up onto the balls of my feet, the door slamming shut behind me. I looked around the corridor trying to place where the central chamber would be compared to me. I was pretty sure I knew the way, but I stopped myself as I saw that I was standing right next to a security station. I ooed softly. My palm pressed to the keypad and I fired off an immense jolt of electrical energy into it. The door sprang open with a squealing growl, hydraulic fluid dripping from the upper edge of the doorframe. I stepped under the droplets and grinned slowly as I looked around the room. The security forces had been overwhelmed too fast to bring out all of their guns. There was an armor locker, which I smashed open with the same brute force electrical overload I had used before. I strapped the green carapace chest on, snapped on the gauntlets. It socketed on and around my spacesuit armor and made me feel less exposed, less naked. I whistled slowly as I pulled out the underslung plasma cannon that was contained in the riot response kit. Templar soft, doesn't fuck around, I whispered, tapping on the weapon and checking the battery. The battery glowed red. A Tesk power source. An infinite power source. I grinned wickedly. Groovy. Sn I walked out of the armory and down the corridor. The plasma cannon was heavy in my arms. Comforting. I followed the sound of violence and came on a pocket of demons rushing towards the fray. They were all warrior brood, their bodies sleek in black carapaces, their tails swishing from side to side. I thumbed on the plasma cannon safety and felt it whir. A glowing reticule projected before my face thanks to some rather handy holographics, and I leveled it on the demon in the lead. I pulled back on the trigger and the upper barrel on the plasma cannon let loose with a torrent of purple-white energy. It flew in a perfectly straight line, hit the warrior brood in the side and caused it to pop like a balloon. Keeping the trigger depressed, I swept the beam around and saw that it dragged like a stream of water. The brood skittered, backpedaling, almost comically trying to back away from the stream, but they failed to move in time. Pop, 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 and I grinned. I like it. I stepped around the last corner and came to the sea of violence that swarmed around the auto turrets. The portal stood in the center of the room, crackling and swirling with energy. I let loose with a stream of plasma, sweeping it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Tesk by the dozens exploded into sprays of gore, and several larger ones turned to face me. The huge beasts looked like they had been augmented by a mad cyberneticist. Rocket launchers attached to their shoulders. I swept the beam along their heads, then dropped the plasma cannon to roll away from the return fire from the survivor. The rockets smashed into the ground. The actual explosions were fairly small, but shrapnel bounced off my green armor, with a sound not unlike hail. I struggled to my feet, just as three warrior bane leaped on me. Their claws dug into my armor, with snarling, screeching sounds. But nothing got through. I grabbed one by the bony hips, throwing him at another, then blasted the third with lightning. I drew my pistol one-handed and my shotgun with the other, sprinting forward. I leaped onto a pile of corpses as the demons surrounded me. Come get some, I snarled. I unloaded an entire magazine into one demon's chest and head, then fired off the shotgun at another. He splattered, and the big fucker shouldered his way forward. His rockets were still reloading or regrowing or something. I tossed my pistol aside, cocked the shotgun, then leapt forward. I landed on the shoulders of one of the other smaller demons, then sprang up and landed on the big fucker's back. I pumped a round of buckshot into his head. He staggered, groaning, reaching up towards me with both hands. I fired again, and this time his head exploded like an overripe melon. As he toppled, I reached down and yanked the implanted rocket launcher free, my arm straining with the effort. 
I held the gory, dripping piece of cybernetics in my hand and sprang off the big fucker as he face-planted onto the ground. Well, bleeding necks dump planted, demons massed before me. I held the rocket launcher up and surged it with a tiny jolt of electricity. I hit something I was supposed to, because the rocket shot out of it, a jet of superheated gas blasting the demon behind me square in the face. The rocket plunged into a terrified-looking warrior's chest, then sent him rocketing backwards into a mass of his friends before the warhead went off. I lifted an arm to shield my face from the splatter. The demons were backing away from me. Blood dripped from my body and I laughed shakily. What? Are... you? The Lightbringer stepped out from the mass of demons, all of them backing away from him, bowing respectfully. Behind me, I heard Jules and the others gasp in shock. Jules, his body covered with tiny scratches, a pistol in his hands called out to me. Who the fuck is that, Beatrice? The Lightbringer spread his hands wide, flicking his fingers. The demons continued to back away from him, bowing low, their foreheads scraping against the ground. He ignored Jules as the quiet whirring of the portal became the loudest sound in the room. I panted softly, breathing in, breathing out. I thought back to the earliest moment I could really remember. Not the boat, not the ritual chamber, not the chanting robed corporate wage slaves, not even the coldness of cryosleep. It was the moment after staggering out into the corridor. It was that strange voice I had heard echoing in my mind. I remembered those words and I smiled. I lifted my head and felt an utter lightness filling my whole being. I knew what I was. I knew what I was supposed to do. And I knew how to do it. I looked right into the Lightbringer's eyes. I'm good enough, I said quietly. I'll do until someone better is found. The Lightbringer's face twisted with rage. His suit was fraying, and a darkness swirled around his body. An infinite blackness, and a twisting, crackling aura of spite. I could almost see wings unfolding behind him. Good enough won't stop me, he snarled. You're right, Lucy, I said casually, but he will. The Lightbringer turned right before Leviathan, emerging from the elevator tube with a squeal of bending metal, smashed into him. The Lightbringer had changed utterly in that moment. There was something huge and spined and black, hissing and roaring. Claws slashed into Leviathan and black blood went flying. Then Levithan's mouth opened wide, and a searing red light burst from between his jaws. I staggered away from the flames as the light brighter struck back, hard enough to send the flames flying out in every direction. Demons screeched and ran for cover. I staggered back into Jewel's hands. He didn't look away from the titanic struggle as the two creatures older than time and greater than humanity slashed and bit and struck. The light bringer was smashed into the wall, denting it outwards. Hissing, screeching air roared past him as I realized they were about to breach the walls. Virgil Station shuddered. The portal behind me cracked and a bright blue light poured from it. Jules! Tracy screamed it at us and we both turned. The portal was opened and showed a large city street. Cars had stopped and people were running from it. I could see the gleam of the Golden Gate Bridge between the bright, smooth faces of the buildings. Several humans with more guts than common sense were holding up their phones filming the portal. Tracy and Amanda and Marisa were already rushing through. Jules dragged me towards it. I could smell the sweat sea breeze. Leviathan unleashed another blast of torrential hellish energy. The searing light cast Jules' face in molten iron. But even through that freakish coloring, I could see the concern in his eyes. We have to go now, he shouted. My hand went to my belly. I'm making a choice multifaceted. Leviathan's voice echoed in my mind. I smiled at Jules. I shook my head. No, he whispered. He grabbed my wrist and tried to tug me forward. The depressurization alarms were going insane. I mouthed a single word at him. Sorry. Then I socked him in the jaw hard enough to send him staggering backwards, through the portal. He scrambled up helped to his feet by several police officers. I lifted my hand and touched my index finger to my thumb and grinned. It was going to be okay. Then I shot the portal's power cables. They sparked, crackled, and the portal shut down with a squeal of doomed souls. Behind me, I saw Leviathan and the Lightbringer going tumbling out into space. The air had vented it out of a hole so massive that the wind had barely tugged at my sleeves. 
I snapped on my spacesuit helmet, clicking it into place. The station was starting to spin now, and I sat down, my back resting against the portal. Every rotation made hell come closer and closer and closer. I grinned. A short life, I thought. But overall, I was happy with it, even if I had never gotten a chance to save a single Tesk hybrid. I looked to the side and checked, and saw that Daniela had been left behind. She was glaring daggers at me. I flipped her off, then closed my eyes and readied myself for the burning heat of re-entry. Something darted past me and I felt myself jerked aside. My head smashed against the inside of my helmet, and I groaned. By the time I blinked away the white fog, I was already kilometers away from Virgil Station. The roughly pyramidal shape of the station was tumbling, tumbling, tumbling. I was held against something vast and black and warm. Wings beat above my head, despite the fact we were in a fucking vacuum. The station drew a searing hot streak underneath us. I watched it, not caring that it left behind a white smear that left my eyes burning with pain. Then, the brightness was overwhelming. I whooped inside of my helmet, tasting blood dripping from my nose. Virgil Station had smashed into the vast plains of hell like the fight of a furious god. The station, easily more than half a million tons of steel, and ceramics and plastic and electrical cabling and fucked up scientific equipment had to have been going terminal velocity. I knew enough about physics to know that that was really going to ruin a load of people's days. And as my vision cleared, I could see the vast swelling bloom of light and color. The racing edges of the firestorms were followed by the smoke and dust kicked up, blotting out the ground underneath my feet. I grinned. Who's the light bringer now? I muttered. We sailed down slower by far than Virgil Station, and so there was no searing heat, no crisping burning re-entry. Instead, there was just a slow settling fatigue. I was becoming aware of how long I had gone without sleep, without food, without fucking water. Adrenaline seeped out of my body and I let myself simply be held like a limp rag. Those huge beating wings started to make sound as an actual atmosphere surrounded us. Then we were through the clouds, Soaring over planes of flames, open, crackling rents in the earth that filled the air with soot. The horizon glowed with the firestorms from Virgil's impacts. Then we were landed. The ground underneath suddenly transformed into an obsidian black field. The arm holding me up let me go, and I gasped as I fell to my hands and knees. I groaned, and let myself roll onto my side. I rolled onto my back and saw that I was laying on the parapet of a massive tower. A castle, timeless, and yet somehow ancient loomed out of the hellscape, and I was sprawled on the roof with Leviathan. The immense dragon leaned forward and licked at his claws, tasting the blood dripping from them. I pushed myself to a seated position. Don't suppose, and he said, my voice raspy, you have anything to eat. Beatrice Montenegro lounged in her bed, silken sheets draped about her as she listened to her muse. And on um, the voice, cool and sexless and modulated in a way designed by expert AI programmers to be utterly relaxing, said, That is the rest of your personal correspondence for the day. Do you wish a newsfeed as well? Beatrice sighed and flicked her finger. An augmented reality window pane that showed her the camera feed on one of her brother's parties skidded out of her field of view. She was trying to not feel jealous, but it was so hard. Her brother wasn't just using the funds that father had left him and the company that mother had left him. He was using them to throw parties that the elite were going to be talking about for months. Gene-sequenced extinct tigers? How gauche. She looked at the point of light that represented her muse and nodded. Firstly, the Eastern Bloc has withdrawn forces from... Skip, Beatrice said, closing her eyes. Secondly, the Virgil Station Oversight Comedy has found several quite damning pieces of evidence against Templarsoft's CEO and board of directors. The United Nations has opened up an inquest, and there are rumors that they might be facing actual charges. That made Beatrice stand up and start towards the bathroom. She needed to splash water in her face to stop herself from shuddering convulsively. The only good thing about that whole horrid business was that whatever had taken the station hadn't left enough evidence on her. The evidence brought by that awful doctor. Dr. Jules Vieux Delacroix, her muse said. Right. She muttered as she rubbed the water into her face. That awful doctor might have taken the corporation down, but at least he... 
She stopped. Her reflection was smirking at her. Beatrice stood stock still, her eyes wide as saucers. Her reflection wasn't just smirking. It was also subtly and grossly different in a dozen different ways. Thin scars seemed several parts of her otherwise naked body. Her breasts were slightly larger, her eyes were warmer than hers, playful even. The reflection then held up a piece of paper, the words written with the two careful strokes of someone deliberately writing backwards, the tiny errors created by this making them look odd, but still readable. Donate fortune to charity. Betrice opened her mouth wide. The reflection flipped the paper, then slapped it against the mirror. Or you will regret it. The will had been underlined and circled a few dozen times. Between blinks, the reflection was normal again. Beatrice stammered. Five minutes later, she was on the phone with her accountant. I don't care how hard it is, she said, clutching the crystal orb of the phone to her head. She could have used her internal comms, but at the moment Beatrice desperately wanted to hold something. Start some charities. R right now. I sprawled in the bed. It didn't seem right for Hell to be quite so comfortable. My aching muscles twinged as Leviathan's hands caressed along my shoulders. I shivered as his cool fingers found places where I'd gotten tight, and he loosened them. I let myself turn into a puddle and reflected on just what a bit of sleep some food, some drink, and a quiet talk could do to someone's perspectives. Lev had taken me to his kitchens and cooked up something that tasted a great deal like a well-marbled ribeye. I had eaten drunk down some beer and gone right to sleep. The next three days had been spent just recovering. There were nightmares, that there were shivers and shakes. Lev didn't talk much, but he did hold me. So there was that. Then when he did talk, it was simple and to the point. Interaction is bi-directional. My brow had furrowed, my cheek pressed to the hard muscle of his belly. I kissed around the soft divot I kept calling a belly button, despite it being no such thing on his alien biology. The kiss had come naturally, though we hadn't shared more than fifty words between one another. It was a bond made in fire and blood and sex. I didn't, wouldn't call it love, but it was something that made a kiss, like that feel as natural as breathing. Okay, I had said. Evil can't come into a world without good leaving it. Lev inclined his head fractionally. His avatar had cables connecting it to his draconic body, which sprawled on a massive pile of obsidian and copper and shale rocks. Smoke rose from several points on his body, wafting down wind over us and filling my nose with his scent. I noticed that as his head was inclined, his dragon body nodded in unison, creating a small cascade of shale rocks. Temporal exigencies force alteration in cyclic systems, he said. Time makes hell different, I translated. He held up his hand, inclining it from side to side. When he spoke, it was his dragon who opened its mouth and the words were deep. Bone rattling, sex moisteningly deep. Possibilities exist. But are resisted, aren't they, I asked quietly. Both nodded. Entrenchment and purpose leads to calcification of mentality. Lev chuckled quietly. I snorted and leaned forward. I found his nipple and bit it gently. He rumbled quietly. I felt a strange squirming happiness in that rumble. Well, ain't that just a pisser? I asked, brushing my hands through my hair. I sat up and shook myself a bit. Lucy runs away from the big G to find freedom. Now who knows how many billions of years later, he's just as stuck in a rut. Biblical allegories are imperfect and inexact, Lev said, shrugging those athletic shoulders of his. Suffice to say that the multiverse remains irreducibly complex. There exist threats larger than a lack of illumination. I shook my head slowly. I can't fucking solve those. You can solve this or help. He looked right into my eyes. I smiled. I'll need a break first. And I had gotten it. Rested, relaxed, equipped. Blackened and scarred by re-entry, my shotgun had been tossed away from the space station and had landed in the vast plains. The artisans loyal to Lev had worked day and night to restore her to working quality. My armor was pitted and scored, but I hadn't wanted it fixed. I liked it weather-beaten. Armed and armored, I stepped out of the front gates of Lev's castle. I rested the shotgun against my shoulder, 
and looked out at the vast steps of hell, the smoldering flames rising and crackling from the pits, the rust-red skies. In the distance, I could see the banners of Lucy's armies, and I grinned. The mind games are over, buddy, as I muttered. And I set off, because I had some hell to pay.